progress. Okay, well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, for the Sabbath hours that are coming, at least for us and some that are already experiencing the blessing of the Sabbath. We just invite your presence to work upon our hearts that you can teach us and direct us and correct us. We ask, Lord, that as we continue to look at um, the studies of Collins, uh, that you can bless us, help us to understand the things that he has presented, to see the truth, and to see the way that you are working in this movement at the present time and in, in this earth, and help us to watch and to wait, to measure the time, and to understand um, what it is, what our present duty is. Be with each person. May your angels watch over them. We pray for those that are suffering health issues. Um, we ask, Lord, that you can help us to follow your laws of health and that we can take care of ourselves. But we know we live in a world of sin, and we ask, Lord, that uh, you can protect us from the things that we have no control over. Bless us now in these studies, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone, and uh, happy Sabbath to those who are experiencing the Sabbath. And, of course, we will be here in about an hour and 15 minutes. Now, the study here is there's a number of things that we have to address. Um, so last week I had drawn out this chart and I've added a couple things to it since then. And this basically is taking um, Collins' study um, and putting it into literal time. That is, we're going to take we we're take the prophetic mirror. So in Colin's study, he had used the prophetic mirror. And I'm just going to actually bring up his diagram here. Um, so. I don't know which one it is. I should have drawn the change the title. I have a lot of things on my computer. Okay, so. Why a lot of things have happened. So it would be this yeah. screenshot here. Yeah, so I've downloaded a lot of things over the last few days. I probably should put this in a different file than in just in my downloads. So when we looked at call and study here, and uh, I know he has a, an updated version of this, which I probably could have copied. He added a couple of things in here um, on Saturday night in his study. And um, what we see here is the prophetic mirror and the 65 years. And we can see that these are going to be marked in uh, the U.S. election dealing with uh, when Joe Biden is elected to the January 6th Siege of Washington. And he's going to mark this as Raffia time at the end. And then he's looking at the midterm elections as being Paneum. So he doesn't, he doesn't have here uh, the dates that we, we ended up marking. We marked all these different dates. And my understanding is he was using this symbolically. So this 46 and 19, he wasn't taking as days, but he did calculate those days. He just wasn't using them. And um, so I understand that he's not, he's not saying it's going to be 65 days from November 8th that the Battle of Paneum is then. Uh, we have a, a match for, so he's not going to say that January 11th, um, uh, uh, 2023 is going to match January 6, 2021. So that he's not not made that claim at all. And so he's going to deal with also uh, some of the symbols here, the King of the South, the United States 
and the world. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what, because I didn't see this study, so I'm not sure exactly what he, he meant by this. Okay. Yeah, so, um, but this is the chart that he had done uh, basically uh, two weeks ago. And, and then he addressed it again Saturday night at the Saturday night study, and he asked that to be recorded. And I watched the recording about halfway through of his study, so I haven't watched the whole thing yet. But then I did talk to Colin, so I talked to him on Sunday, and, and we went over some of these things. So we're going to talk about some of this. So we discussed some of what he was presenting, and... Uh, so we're going to address those points. So I'm going to go back to my diagram. So in my diagram, I do have the time there, but I'm not claiming that Colin is time setting at all. Never made that claim, and I wasn't even thinking that that's what he was doing. So, so that was something that was misunderstood when I actually put these dates here. So I, I thought I had made it clear that that I'm marking these dates that Colin isn't, um, but that we have witnesses that these dates, in spite of the fact that Colin's not marking them, that they are witnesses. Now, when we look at dates in the future, is that time setting? I would say so. Okay, well, we, we've taken the position that we can put dates in the future. So for instance, December 25th, 2021, we, we never had any event. We had a symbolic representation of the Sunday law um, on December 25th, 2021. That's what we always had said. We didn't expect any particular event. We talked about the possibility of what kind of event could be there, but we didn't have anything specific that could tell us that on that date, something's going to happen. And we did with July 18th, and we did with November 9th, but we didn't do that with March 27th, 2021, and we didn't do that with December 25th, 2021. Um, now, if you remember, so, so Bonnie, you said that that is time setting. Can you explain why that would be time setting in your definition? I think there's a difference between looking at an event that is um, already scheduled by, you know, a government or whatever, and um, a difference between that and looking at numbers. And like, for example, you've got here the 1533 days. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, an, that's retroactive, so that's not time setting. But if you were to take that 1533 days from Biden's inauguration and project that into the future as a mirror and then set a date based on that and say that it's typifying an event, I would, I mean, that to my understanding, that would be time setting an event, time setting okay. with time. Okay, so to me, time setting is predicting an event based upon a date. So if I said, mm -hmm. I put a date in the future and I say on this date, this is going to happen. That would be time setting. But we've had lots of dates in that we had projected in the future, even way back before July 18th had passed, that we had marked um, some of them, Daniel um, Vanderhorst had marked um, dates like August 13th, which we understood were just symbolic dates. We didn't say, well, August 13th, because it's a symbol of. Palmoni, and it was part of the structure of our dates. So we didn't say, well, that we we then are expecting an event on that date. We thought, you know, something could happen. It might be internal, or there might be something that occurs on that date. But but we couldn't say what it would be. And so my understanding of placing dates in the future, whether they're dates that exist on a calendar already, like November eighth, something that has been, you know, the midterm election is then. Um, uh, because we had some dates that were already projected by other people based upon the structure, and things did occur in connection with those dates, but we could not understand them until the time had passed. So, 
my understanding of it is that we are to measure the time not so that we can predict events but so that after the time has passed we can understand the significance of the events that do occur and especially as they relate to this movement internally that is most of what we have seen even though there's external events that they witness to internal uh, symbolism within the movement that it's not so much about so for instance january 6 2021 its significance for us um, is tied up with all of the dates and times that we have established before so we know it's 187 days from um, the end of the 100 days of prayer and we have marked march 27th 2020 which was the start of 100 days of prayer and which went to July 4th and July 4th is a symbol of the first day of the first month for the United States. And so the 187 days going to January 6th marks January 6th as the 10th day of the seventh month. It also happens to be the 22nd day of the 10th, the biblical calendar. So it has the symbol of October 22nd. And then it marks the beginning of 10 days of prayer that are going to end on January 16th. And, and so January 16th had already been marked uh, by the brother from uh, Vietnam based upon dividing the 777 days into um, uh, 434 days and 343. So that happened to be the 434th day of the 777 structure. And so he had marked that date, but he didn't know what was going to happen on that date. So I think it's important that we look at dates in the future, whether they're chosen, such as the November 8th election, or whether they're just uh, looking at this symbolic structure. That is, we don't have to have anything happen on January 11th, 2023, for the symbolism of this structure to give witness to what Colin has presented. So even though Colin's not putting literal days here, right, he's not marking these dates, uh, December 24th, uh, 2022, and January 11th, 2023, but when we put those dates there, we have this witness that this structure is sound. So that would give validity to the basic idea that Colin is presenting. Right? Okay, yeah, I, th I see what you're saying. And um, yeah, like looking at a retrospective analysis of events and then um, a retrospective calculation of dates, days or weeks, hours, seconds, whatever, is yeah. one thing. Um, and but yeah, so I think people are quite leery, though, of <clears throat> something where, like, for example, the 219 French Republican weeks. Well, that, that is, that, those that, are between two scheduled. That's a retrospective. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but so I, I don't know why people would be leery if we're not predicting anything. That is, we're no, not but predicting I think, anything on. No, January I think it's quite, yeah. That, I just, yeah, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. I know it's not, not predictive. It's just a different focus. It's a focus on on looking at the numbers rather than events and the symbols of the King of the South, the King of the North. Those kinds of things are, I don't see them on your chart, and maybe you do have them at some point, but it's okay. a just a different focus. Okay, so the problem with, so the way that we have understood what has happened in the past is that we have always been wrong. Right, you would agree with us there that everything that we have tried to predict has been wrong. That is, we could not predict events. We haven't been able to do it yet. But we've had witness of the structure to those dates and symbols. So we saw with Adilio, he was using, for instance, the 780 days when he was going through uh, the, the mandates. And we could see that that symbol was sound because 780 days is 18,720 hours. 
We can also see it has uh, a symbol of 11, 111 weeks and um, with the inclusion of three days. So this 25, 259,200 seconds is um, three days. So this is um, kind of hard to explain without going into some of the other structures. But uh, this symbol comes from uh, 25920 is the number of parts of a Hebrew day. Um, so, so it's naturally going to be that three days is going to be this many seconds. But, um, but it's this, it's 111 weeks and the symbol of three days can be understood this. I could have put it 111 weeks and three days. But, but this witness goes from uh, this November 22nd date. So November 22nd is a date that's passed. And in Colin's chart, he doesn't put the date there. He counts these 19 days and the 46 days, which he's doing an inclusive count. So when we put November 22nd here, November 22nd becomes a symbol. And that, that symbol goes all the way back to 977 BC on the 15th day of the eighth month when uh, Jeroboam is offering on the altar in Bethel and the prophet comes in and, and gives the prophecy regarding Josiah. And that's November 22nd. So we have this symbol of November 22nd that goes back at least to that. There's other connections with this as well. So, so Colin has these dates. He just doesn't put that date here. He does put January 6th and he does put November 3rd. So this date then is implied. And if we count from that date, it's going to bring us to, um, with this line here, where is this? Is that, no, I'm looking at the wrong date. Actually, I need to look at this date. Um, this is actually November 3rd. So I'm going to go back to the election date that's coming up. Or this is the one that's passed. This is Biden's election. And if I count here, I get 781 days. So this is one day more. If I did it the other way, it's 780. And that's because of how he's doing the count. So 781 days is also a symbol of July 18th, just in reverse. And, and we can see that if we take the number 187, 187 is 11 times 17. 71 times 11 is 781. So this is a mirror. Now this isn't that unusual with any number that's not anybody, but lots of numbers that are divisible by 11 have this uh, characteristic that they show the inversion of the number that's the product, right? So, but this is an interesting idea that we can take 781 symbolizes July 18th, just as 780 days also symbolizes July 18th. So here we're going from the center of this one and the center of this one. So there's the two centers. Um, we also have um, just this witness from Trump's election to the midterm election coming on November 9th. We have 202 2,190 days. Now, it's 219 French Republican weeks because there's 10 days in, in a week in the French Republican calendar. So it, it's just kind of something that Iran noted that he thought might be significant uh, just as a symbol. But we can also see from Trump's win to Biden's inauguration is 219 weeks. So again, we have that 219 weeks as well as the 1,533 days. 1,533 days is the number of days from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. And so these symbols are coming from past prophecies. And then all we're doing is taking these symbols that we've already been given, that we've already been using. And when we analyze the literal time of what Colin is talking about, it bears witness to it. Never do we simply um, 
take a structure and predict a date in the future in such in, in a very simplistic way. It is there always is multiple witnesses that it's part of a structure that we already have. So when we go from the siege of Washington D.C. Uh, to this this at the end of these 46 years. So the end of the 46 years is going to go to December 24th, 2022. It's 718 days. And uh, so this is an important symbol. And if we go between the siege of Washington, D.C. to the midterm election in 2022, it's 672 days. And 672 days is 7 times 8 times 12. So these numbers contain all of the symbols of July 18, 2020, except the zero. So 1872, it's just in a different order. So different iteration. So I don't think there should be any apprehension on the part of placing a date in the future. Now, this was one of the things that the December 6th declaration that uh, was put out by FFA back in 2020 said that we couldn't do. So they didn't like the fact that we still had December 25th, 2021 in the future. But we remember that the first presentation that Colin did on uh, the understanding of Daniel chapter 3 in connection with Revelation 17 and Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 to 3, was done on December 25th. We also had uh, a bunch of light that came from Stephen in his studies. What we saw on December 25th was not some event fulfilled, but we saw that the line that we had was attached to an increase of light. And this is the thing that I've mostly noticed about the dates that we have been projecting. They, they're projecting the light from the midnight cry into the future to give light for our feet. Not so that we can predict events, but that as events unfold, we can see what's at our feet so we know that we're on the right course. So these are an objective witness. Now, when it comes to our interpretation of future events and what could occur, what we find is that we are wrong. That is, we're not able to predict what events are going to occur or on a certain date or what even the significance of that date is and, and why is this so why are we not able to do this what did god teach us about this So what have we been learning as we've gone through the last um, year and a half or so? Um, since July 18th, what, what has God been trying to teach us? Anyone? Okay, anybody, has anybody learned anything since July 18th? Just on a personal level of what God's trying to teach us. There's a lot of symbols. Okay, so there's a lot of symbols. Yeah, and, and we know that. So God's taking these symbols, and these symbols all come from where, Iran? Scripture and uh, historical okay. events, I guess. Yeah, so from the past. And, and we've added a few, though most of them we already had by July 18th. There's a few that we've noticed, uh, you know, um, 
Odilio brought in the 1629 symbol. But it's actually just attached to these other symbols um, in the way that it's produced. But what is God trying to teach us about ourselves and about the movement? That, that we already kind of knew, but he's, he's teaching us more deeply, I guess. Have we learned anything from July 18th? Let's start there. Did July 18th teach us anything? Repeating the past. Okay. So we're repeating the past. Yeah. And now we already knew we were repeating the past. Did, did we learn about where where we were re repeating the past or what past we were repeating more closely? Bonnie, you have a thought? No, I just wanted uh, someone to explain what past has been repeated that has been learned. Okay, so Millerite history. So we've always taught that we're repeating Millerite history. So Daniel Fontenot brought out really clearly that July 18th, was a repeat of the Great Disappointment. Now, did we expect that we were going to have a disappointment on July 18th? Yeah. No. No. So when our disappointment happened, we recognized that we were repeating the disappointment of the Millerites and, and that we should have, we probably should have expected it but of course, if we had expected of it, it, we wouldn't have had a disappointment, right? So it's kind of one of those little things that had to happen. Now, we had hints of it. So Jeff had presented the idea that um, our July 18th prediction was Abraham offering up Isaac. Also that it was parallel to Jonah giving a prediction, the 40 days. And in both of those, does, does, does Abraham actually offer a fire? He doesn't follow through with it. Okay, so yeah, because God stops him. But if we look at the parallel, what would we say about him offering up Isaac that would be a parallel with July 18th? Is Abraham being tested? Yep. Okay. Were we being tested with July 18th? Yes. Yeah. So, so, so we can see that we were being tested. Did we have the faith to go through with the whole process of warning people in Nashville? Did we believe God? We were, our faith was being tested. Now, some people, after July 18th, they lost their faith in the message, basically just repudiated it, right? They, they rejected it in the end. Uh, the, the December 6, 2020 declaration basically is a rejection of the entire message because there's no way that you can just reject July 18th without rejecting all of the things that led to it. And Jeff understood this quite well, that July 18th was um, basically where everything that he had ever studied led to. 
that this was the culmination of all these years of study, that everything now came together with this prediction. And, and so we can see the parallel with Millerite history. So we, we experienced something that, that said well, we were repeating Millerite history. Now, the other thing just directly to answer Bonnie's question about, it, uh, about what history we're repeating, one of the things that we had always taught is that we're, we're going, that the parable of the 10 virgins has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled again to the very letter. And in understanding this, I think for the first time we came to understand that this is the first and second angel's messages that are being repeated to the very letter. Now, we also spent a lot of time studying the foundation of the message. And in doing so, we came to understand that, um, that this movement is really about the Sunday law. It was from the beginning. Jeff's focus always was about law, and he would attach the Sunday law to Revelation chapter 18. After 9-11, he had to try to understand what had happened at 9-11, and he then attached the first three verses to 9-11. So the symbols that he had for the Sunday law, he tied to 9-11. And as we've gone through these studies, especially over the last year, we came to understand that this movement, 9-11 is actually part of the Sunday law. That is, we're zooming into the way mark that Ellen White sees as the Sunday law. And that's what this movement is. That is, in order for the Sunday law to come in, its, in Ellen White's line, we need to have a repeat of Millerite history. That is the first and second angel's messages need to be repeated because the Sunday law is the third angel's message. That is, at the Sunday law, according to Ellen White, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. And then it's going to join the third angel, and that message will swell to a Now, we have a midnight cry that precedes the Sunday law, and that midnight cry is a repeat of Millerite history. But Ellen White and Jeff, prior to 9-11, clearly show that the parallel to the midnight cry in Millerite history is the loud cry that happens after the Sunday law. But we have a midnight cry that happens before the Sunday law. And this was a contradiction or a problem it wasn't really resolved or we didn't have a good answer to until after July 18. That we can see that this is the Sunday law, that that repeat of, that is, we can't just take the midnight cry from Millerite history and apply it to the midnight cry of our history as what Ellen White is talking about. We have to see that, that ours is a repeat of history or a type of what's going to happen during the loud cry. So, so these things, of course, there's lots involved in this, and we, we've been addressing these in, in different ways, um, th these ideas, in studying different things, and we're, we're seeing now in studying the stories in the Bible, these same things happening again and again. So we studied in detail Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and then, of course, Caleb and Moses, and all these, all these history, Moses and Joshua. And Caleb and Joshua, all, the, all this history. Now we're in the time of Joshua. And we're seeing all these same symbols showing up and all the same way marks showing up. And the same thing where we can zoom into a way mark and see an entire reform line. So our reform line is just a zooming in to the way mark of the Sunday law. So, so we go through all that because what we're trying to understand right now is what it means when we look at an event in the future. So we know there's this midterm election, and we know that it's witnessed to as part of this structure. Now, we also know that we have raffia happen at January 6, 2021. So the siege of Washington, D.C., we understand to be a typical raffia. So why do I say it's a typical raffia? 
Why do I say it's a type? Because what is raffia, according to our understanding of them? What did we look at raffia as in the past? Because we attached raffia to November 9th originally. So what was raffia supposed to be? Just in its simple, simple understanding. The king of the north falling and the king of the south rising. Okay, so so the battle of Raphia in the past was going to typify what was going to happen. So who was the king of the north in our understanding? We're thinking of Trump and Biden, not Trump being the king of the north and Biden being the king of the south in this in this. Yeah. But back in the past with November 9th, we weren't talking about Biden. So in November 9th, we had that marked as Raffia. So who was the king of the north on November 9th that we were predicting, that this movement predicted? And Jeff was part of that. So the king of the north would be the United States and the king of the south would be Russia. So I'm just reading Iran's chat notes there. So Russia is going to be the king of the south. That's what we were teaching. Now, Jeff was teaching this first presented Raphian and Paneum together in Alberta on January 14th, 2016. And or 2017, pardon me, I think it is 2000, 2017. January 14th, 2017. And, and this is after he had heard about uh, Raffia when he was in Wales back in, in December of, I think it was December 17th, if I remember, 2016. So, so he's going to be in Alberta. He's going to present this. And this is going to be uh, part of the structure. That is, it's going to be... Um, just to remind us, uh, I know I, this isn't. Yeah, can you refresh my memory? Yeah. Maybe others are familiar with it. I'm sorry, but I'm not aware where Jeff mentioned Russia. I mean, obviously, Russia was the king of the south, but that is the dragon power that then shifts over to the United Nations. Yeah, but he never so had it, he not, never had it shift to the United Nations, though. So back when he presented this, I'm going back to what he had presented. He's going to present this um, on January 14th. You see it here, 2017. And that's going to be 1,533 days before March 27th, 2021. And uh, March 27th, 2019, with March 27th, 2020 in the center. Um, it's going to be 1,533 weeks to March 27th, 2019, from November 9th, 1989. So we have these witnesses, and, and this is going to be the fall of the Soviet Union. And so what we see here is that Jeff in January 14th, he's going to start to understand the idea that the head is Moscow, that it only came up to the neck. And so he's going to look at the King of the South was not defeated in 1989, that it's still going to be Russia. So the idea that we're transferring it to the UN, um, as far as I know, I'm the first one who did that. So I did that in connection with January 6, uh, January 6, 2021. We weren't doing that. We weren't changing the King of the South from Russia until after uh, the siege. And maybe even a little bit before that, but um, so so the so idea. I remember Jeff. I remember um, when that was discussed, like coming up to the neck. I thought that was after 2017. I, I mean, I I've watched that video. I was I was there in person. Mm -hmm. um, I know the focus was the was pandemic, Pandora's box, um, mm -hmm. 
and raffia and panium, but uh, yeah, don't. Yeah, he had to, and I know we were talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We were talking about, you know, um, Daniel chapter 11, verse whatever it was, 42, where, you know, the hold of the USSR fell, in, but not in, not in that. Not, not all the details. That being no, so it's that Remember the talk mm-hmm. about whether it's going to be a hot war or a cold war, and then it was between Russia and the US. Right. So that was discussed. Yes. Hot yeah. war, cold war, electromagnetic pulse, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So Jeff mm-hmm. later, as he studied into this, addressed the idea of how the how the Soviet Union didn't get completely later. Mm-hmm. right. So that's right. That, that was, was later after that. Yes, it was a development. He didn't do that all on January fourteenth. I'm not suggesting. No, that. no. But he started at least with the idea that that Russia was not at the end because Russia is now going to be involved in Rafia and Panea. So that's how we understood it in 2017. And so he developed that understanding through 2017. Yeah, that there would be a reversal of what happened with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the King of the North against the King of the South, that it would be a reversal of 30 years hence. Right. That's why we were looking at November 9th of 2019. Exactly. So, so it took time for this all to develop. It all didn't happen overnight. So Jeff didn't have all, all everything put together. But Jeff never taught that the UN is the king of the South. He actually taught. Yeah, we talked that about years. that actually. I remember learning about that for years at like whenever somebody new would come into our Bible study, we would go over the statue of Daniel 2, the kingdom of glory, the kingdom of grace. You know, the, the the first four kingdoms and the last four kingdoms. And it was always um, translated in the kingdom of grace that that the seventh kingdom would be the United Nations. That's yes. That's been for years. Uh, we under- yeah, we understand that. But I'm saying that the symbol of the king of the south, uh, Jeff spoke against attaching that to the UN. So, so that was something he was pretty clear that he wasn't looking at the UN as the king of the south. He was looking at Russia as the king of the south. Yes, in the Battle of Panium, yes. Yeah. But in yeah, the and kingdoms, he never did change that view. He never changed that view. You won't find anywhere where Jeff said, now I'm going to attach the symbol of the king of the south to the UN. Because when J- January 6th happened, it was very difficult uh, to convince people of that point because Jeff had been so adamant about the idea that the King of the South is Russia. And um, so, so we didn't have the, the symbol of the King of the South attached to the UN. That is, as far as one who developed that idea and, and how that happens. Well, yeah. it, wasn't so, the, it wasn't the United Nations that was coming against, that was, you know, part of the, that was part of the uh, Battle of Panium. It was not the United Nations. That right. was never brought up. It exactly. was an understanding that it was a mirror of the King of the North being yeah. defeated by the King of the South, or sorry, yeah. a- attacking the King of the South, the USSR, Russia, right. and in 1989, exactly. 30 years exactly. hence. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the point that I'm making, that Jeff never attached that to the UN. That symbol of no, no, that no, that that was never no, that was not appropriate for that timeline, that retrospective analysis, or even predictive analysis, looking at past events and and looking at Daniel eleven, um, verse whatever forty two, or forty forty one forty, where you know there's the reversal, but in the kingdoms, in you know right, but there was an understanding that. We all yeah. agree. With that. Yeah, we, so, all, we all know that. So that's okay. not um, that's not what we're talking about. Though we're not talking about the kingdoms. We're talking about Rafi and Panea. So those were never attached <laughs> to uh, the way that Colin is doing it now. The way that we're doing this now, looking at January sixth as being the globalists, as being Rafia. That's something that Jeff never would have done because he never had the globalists as the king of the south. 
in in that context of that king of the north, king of the south uh, duality. Well, I think I think um, the king of the south in Collins' presentation is the Democrats of the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever they're the puppet for, but it is right. but, looking. But it, yeah, because they were overcome yeah, so, by the Wolves. Yeah, we understand that. So I, I don't. Mm -hmm. Well, at least mm -hmm. I, and I think all of us who've been studying this, we know. But I'm not. I'm not so much focusing upon what Colin is doing here. I'm just saying that when Jeff did this with Rafi and Paniam, he never attached that history to Rafi no. and. Paniam. But now we are, right? And and we can go. So to you're doing it retrospectively, way. attaching the United Nations. You mean you're attaching the United Nations to? We're t well. We're, what we're saying Russia? is the United Nations is the king of the south. That Russia is not the king of the south in this raffia. That we're attaching the Democrats who are globalists, which is part of the United Nations agenda. That's what happened on January 6th. That is, the United States was conquered by Greece on January 6th. Well, if because I think, yeah, if you want to say, okay, Greece, I mean, you're looking more globally rather than, you know, ethnocentrically at the United States. Well, the United States is conquered by Greece. So, so when we look at Trump as Xerxes, so this this is part of the the disagreement, I guess, I have with Colin, if you want to put it as a disagreement. But right now, what we're doing is studying. So, no conclusions have been drawn completely. Everything that Colin is doing, everything that we're doing, and looking at what Colin is doing, and everything that that we have done even previously, leading up to that is we're looking at information and we're trying to bring all of the information together so that we can get the full picture. We haven't drawn conclusions. We have tentative you know, uh, solutions, but we can't say we know everything and, we, and we're, we're going to be really definite about all of this. Right now we're just studying. But when it came to uh, January 6th, so I'll go back to um, this diagram, wherever it is. So when we, when we got to the siege of Washington, D.C., we had all of these symbols that showed that it typified even what we were predicting with July 18th. That is, July 18th was a typification, and Washington, D.C., the siege, uh, was connected to December 25th, uh, 2020, with the bombing that happened in Nashville by 13 days, it was connected to the pandemic. It was connected to the structure of the days of prayer. It was connected to all of these different things. And the way that we understood Washington, D.C., at least the way that our study group that I've been doing had understood it, is that um, the symbols here with Washington, D.C., showed with the, with the siege showed that we were on the right track, but we still didn't know how to address the fact that we saw this as raffia, but who were the players? Now, when we looked at the Civil War, so Heidi and I had spent time back in 2018 studying the Civil War, and that, that study was sort of shut down, and then it was hijacked by uh, Tess. So Tess ended up uh, doing uh, some things with the Civil War that were completely different than what we saw in the Civil War. So the American Civil War, you have the King of the the King of the South is the Democrats, and the King of the North is the Republicans. So we can see that quite clearly. And this goes back to the Civil War. So what we had done is we had connected the Civil War in the revolutions and the Civil Wars. So we had connected what happened when the Kingdom divided in 977 when uh, Jeroboam took over the northern kingdom and Rehoboam took over, uh, Rehoboam was the king of the south, right? And then we're going to see a civil war again in 742. And we know that civil war in 742 is connected to the civil war 
in 18, the 1860s, and how is it connected? How do we connect that Civil War? North and South? Well, how do we connect the Civil War in the United States in the 1860s? How do we connect that with the Civil War in 742 BC? So as Iran puts in the chat there, it's the, the prophetic mirror, the two 2520s give us this structure. So that's this structure here, right? So we know that this structure of the 19 and the 65, and then this span of time, and then the 46 and the 19, comes to us from the prophetic mirror. That's the way that Colin did it in his study. He put the prophetic mirror up at the top, and, and then he put, says, well, Raffi and Paneum then is representing the civil war in the United States. And, and that this civil war that happens where Trump loses becomes um, the, the king of the south defeating the king of the north, that's Raffia. And then we have this midterm election, and we're going to say that that's going to be Trump winning. So the king of the north then is going to win and eliminate the king of the south. So that's going to be Panean. That's, that's the study that Colin has presented. That's how he's looking at this. And he's looking at the Republicans and the Democrats as representing uh, the king of the south and the king of the north, respectively. He's also tying in uh, the 19th Republican president and the 46th president of the United States, as well as the 45th there. Um, so we know that, that he's taking these symbols, which he had already established before with the 20, uh, um, the 20 and the 19. So what was the 20 and the 19? Anybody remember Colin's studies on the 20 and the 19? Tabo ended up yes, the using it. Mm -hmm. So Bonnie? Presidents of the conference. Yeah. Conference so, presidents. So there, he's using the king of the north as, as who? King of the north would be who in that study of the 20 and the 19? Because which kingdom has 19 kings? Which kingdom has 20 kings? I think it was a comparison of um, the, yeah, I'm not sure. Just go, um, no, it's not Wilson. I don't, oh, Ted Wilson, yeah. But yeah. Um, I think he becomes the king of the, the Adventist conference represents, you know, as the remnant. Judah. Um, Judah, that's correct. Judah, that's which is the southern right? okay. kingdom. And the king of the north. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which would be the Protestants. The yeah, United Israel. States. Okay. So, right. we have, mm -hmm. so we have the northern kingdom is the Republican Party represents the northern kingdom, but the south is not represented by you know, the globalists in that study, it, it's representing Judah and Israel. So it becomes an internal line. But now in this line, we're just taking these same symbols, or at least some of the symbols, and we're, we're addressing the United States itself, which would be normally the king of the north. That is, um, in, in this case, Biden as the 46th president, he can't be the king of the north. And, and why not? Why can't Biden be the king of the north? You understand what I'm asking? <clears throat> So there's some things that aren't quite clear in, at least to, in my mind, with Colin's study, because I had a talk with him about it. And 
I mean, he's not marking Biden as as a continuation of of Trump, right? So Biden himself, he's the 46th president. So we have him there as a symbol. But this is more about the Democrats rather than Biden, correct? Yeah, Biden represents atheism. He represents this spiritual power. He represents the king mm -hmm. of the South, right? No. Now, if, oh, well, yeah, the king of the South, yes. Right, yeah. right. So so that's that's what Biden would represent. But it's mostly the Democrats, right? It's not so much about Biden because Biden would just be seen as a puppet. He's definitely mm -hmm. not um, really running the show. So... So when we look at the siege of Washington, D.C. on January 6th, we would have to say, well, um, it's going to be these 65 days, which is an inclusive count or an ordinal count, past the November 3rd election. So Trump loses this election on November 3rd. And, and we would look, we'd say, well, normally you're just going to wait till the inauguration and then Biden uh, comes into play. But God in his providence had this event occur that basically that's really where you're going to mark the end of the United States. And Trump is the last president of the United States. So even though the Democrats continue the United States, they can't continue to be the king of the North. The Democrats now are the king of the South. Where the United States is the king of the North. Right? That's how we understood it. Whether they were Republican or Democratic presidents, we didn't have them switch back and forth between King of the North, King of the South, right? It's all just the United States. It's Protestantism. But when Biden comes in, this changes. We can now say that's the end of the United States in a prophetic sense, because the, the Democrats control the United States. So in this study, Colin is saying, well, and, and we're going to look into this in the coming weeks. But what I'm trying to, to set out here is, is the problem. So the problem, whether we, without looking at um, Revelation 17, which we're going to do, and we're going to look at other histories, biblical histories, mm -hmm. and histories of the United States and the Civil and Republican Wars, or the Revolutionary Wars <clears throat> within the United States, and how these are typifying what's happening now. But we know that what's happening now is also a typification. And we know that because Ellen White is predicting this coming sun Sunday law. So she predicts a Sunday law. But she only tells us about a repeat of history in connection with that Sunday law. And we know that in Millerite history, in early Adventist history, Christ could have come. That is, the events of the Sunday law could have occurred in that history, but they didn't. And Parminder and Tess uh, cleverly muddied the waters for us when it comes to looking at 1863 and 1888 and, and all that history um, in connection with what they were talking about regarding there's not going to be a Sunday law. And, and, and it's something that they actually had some ideas that that were correct, but they mixed a bunch of error with it. And we know that that's what Satan does. He takes truth, he mixes it with error because he wants to make it more palatable. Uh, but also he wants people mm -hmm. to ignore the truth. He wants us to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So in, in, in studying- yeah, can I just, can I just inter sorry, yeah. Theodore, I'm sorry. I just need to, before we lose the point, because um, I think, just going back a couple of minutes ago to what you you were saying, the United States has come to an end when you may remember making that comment because it's just a different line. In my understanding, it's just a different line. It's just like a, a focusing in, just like, you know, northern Israel, southern Israel, um, and then, you know, making a comparison between the United States and the Adventist Conference. It doesn't mean it's the end of the United States because the Adventist conference comes in. It's it's a it's a it's a different line. It's like a fractal. It's repeating that's, the same thing. That's, that's exactly and to my right. understanding. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. So there's nothing inconsistent that I'm seeing. I never said you know, there was I'm not seeing anything inconsistent. 
I never said anything was okay. Infamous. Yeah. You never okay. heard me use that word. Well, no, I, I mean, when my, in my understanding, it's yeah. inconsistent if you're saying the United States has ended with Joe Biden because no, there is going to be another presidential election. And yeah, I mean, the roles change depending on who is being compared with who, right? Because it's a different line. Yeah, that's, that's, my, the, the way that's that why I understand you say it. the United States ended on January 6, 2021. So, yeah, so I'm not saying- Well, the line of looking at the United States, yeah. I, I think that's kind of confusing to say it that way though. Okay. Because it's uh, Democrats okay. and Republicans, right? <laughs> Within yeah. the United States. Okay, so I'll address that point. So when we say that the United States ended, what we're doing is we're looking at our lines. We made predictions. But those predictions that we were making, we misunderstood, just like the Millerites misunderstood, the time in which they were, right? That is, they didn't understand that the, that the Christ work in the holy place was going to begin. They just thought everything would be wrapped up. They didn't see that separation of Christ, uh, or not holy, the most holy place beginning and the holy place ending. So they saw everything with the most holy place would just happen in a day because the day of atonement's a day. But we know that that day of atonement is a period of time and it took them time to understand that. But when we studied what the Millerites taught, the thing that we found is that they weren't wrong in, the, in an essential sense. That is, they weren't doing misapplications of prophecy and getting things all wrong. What they were doing is not fully understanding the implications of what they were saying. So, mm, right, because I'm um, just to interject there, they didn't understand, well, they knew, but they kind of left it out or forgot that yeah. Christ had to go into the holy place before the most holy place. It's like basic understanding yeah. for Adventists. Think, right. And also, they had. Um, they had a whole bunch of things that have to happen before Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. And none of those things happened and they just set them aside. Right. Right. And that's, that's what Colin is saying that we did the same thing looking at Trump being the last president, because wait a minute, if you look at the application of the riddle, it's the eighth kingdom has to come. And how can it be without having um, like being resurrecting something, somebody from the previous seven. Yeah, That's the that. parallel that he's drawing with no right history. Yeah, yeah and I, I think just the, the only mistake he's making, as far as I can tell, is saying that it has to be Trump. That's that's the only problem I have with anything that he's saying. Everything else. So you're thinking. So then, okay, I understand that. So, but if there has to be a rest, well, this is. I'm not saying there has to be anything. It's just looking at the Bible, what the Bible is saying, and drawing conclusions that the eighth is of the seven. So the the eighth has to be one of the previous seven. If we're looking at that application, if we're applying that riddle to this situation, okay. that's the only that's the only reason for saying Trump, because he was already that. one of the previous. Seven. Yeah. yeah. The only thing is that we have other precedents that we have to look at. So okay. that's what we're going to be doing, because when I first started this study after, you know, after December 25th, so whatever date that was, the next Friday, um, and I laid out the problem of what the, the, the path that we have to go on, is that we have to look at all of the information. That is, we can't just take some of the pieces and look at them. We need to look at everything. So, so we have precedents, and one of the precedents that we had um, with the eighth had to do with the last seven kings, and we're going to look at that uh, next week, and we're going to go back over this. But we had uh, the last seven kings of Judah, and then we're going to have that the kingdom's going to be overturned, overturned, overturned until he come whose right it is. So we know that the eighth is Christ. So we have seven kings, but there the eighth is is going to be Christ. And, and the question is, why can we do that? 
because we know that there's a parallel between the the kings of Judah, the kings of Persia, the kings of 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 Israel, right? Both at the beginning and the endings, but most in, you know all of them come to play. And the United States here, we have then the same sort of picture, right? We have the same history, the same, the set last seven kings of the United States, if you want to put it that way. And, and we never really understood what we were doing particularly with some of this. So now when we look at this, my suggestion is, is simple. Let's look at everything. Let's look at how the Millerites understood things. Maybe we can draw something from that 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 we've missed. Let's look at all of the past histories that deal with seven kings. And, and can we see an eighth? And if there's an eighth, how is that to be understood? That That's all I'm saying. So yeah, and the I, can, that, I can see that. But yeah. my question about doing that with the last seven kings of Judah is that, you know, to to extrapolate that there has to be an eighth from the seven of those kings simply because of this riddle, um, if if that is is in fact what you're saying, it mm-hmm. it's it's not really a parallel with what Colin is teaching because what Colin is doing is looking at chapter chapter three of Daniel, saying mm-hmm. that okay, why did Nebuchadnezzar use a millennial man? Why did he use a statue of a man that mm-hmm. was all gold? The statue of the man exemplifies the kingdoms, a sequential succession of of uh, of kingdoms. But mm-hmm. because it's all gold, it, it's the topic is worship, and so I think it's really specific doing yeah. that application to mm-hmm. to that in that theme of worship, and mm-hmm. uh, to say that it's parallel with the seven the last seven kings of Judah or Israel, whatever, is not the same thing because that was not part of millennial, the millennial statue, and it's not representing kingdoms. It's like one kingdom, seven kings, mm-hmm. but it's not up to do with worship either, okay. which is the theme of all of this because we're talking about a Sunday law. Yeah, I understand. We're talking about a Sunday law, which is the theme of it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and like in terms of predictions, predictions, you know, we're cautioned not to predict times, but events, we're not... We're not said, you know, even Ellen White predicted an event. We all as Adventists predict an event, right? So to look for the way marks and to look for the symbols of that event is is really important to do. And with which an advancing predict- light. So, so when we use time here. Yeah, which is what, what we're we're not predict is time. to look at everything, which is like a macroscopic vision to look at everything. How can you actually pick out the salient things that relate to a topic? That's my confusion anyways. Well, it takes and time. I'll, I'll silence myself. Yeah, it takes time to do that. So so when we did this, we started mm-hmm. learning lots of things that we didn't know. And all of those things that we didn't know have all come together in, in both in Collins studies and in Odilia studies and in Stephen's studies and in our morning studies. So when we start to look at everything, and now I understand, you know, people can just say, well, that's a lot of information, but we're just taking time to do that. Once we get everything sorted out, then you will see how these things are all connected. Uh, I don't think that you can say that, because I agree with Colin, that uh, what he says about uh, Daniel chapter three, and also what he says about uh, Daniel chapter 11, except just some little details. And that's because we have other witnesses that do relate to this, and they also relate um, to other things that that we are studying. So that is everything that we are studying is telling us the same thing. That is, it's not telling us something different. Everything's coming together. Now, in presenting this, I have to present it in bits and pieces, right? That is, if if we're going to understand this, one is we have to study it together, and we're learning as we go. But in no way are we saying that we're we're going to just dismiss anything that Colin is saying, or anything that Adilio is saying, or anything that Daniel is saying, 
anything that anyone's saying. We're just saying that we're taking the time to look at it and to understand it fully. And part of understanding it fully, if we're going to understand the present, we need to understand the past. So we look at the things of the past, things that we missed. And the reason we missed it is because we weren't at that time yet that we could, that that past was shining on our path. So if you remember what Ellen White says, that as we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, those events will reflect upon past events, and those past events will shine light forward into our time to give light for our feet. Now, it's kind of a, a paraphrase of what she's saying, but, but the events in the past, and, and that's as we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy. Now, the witness that's been given this movement has been these dates, right? So when we passed January 6th, 2021, then we saw, oh, this is connected to part of this structure that we had. But we, we didn't predict January 6th. And, and just because we put some dates in the future doesn't mean we're predicting any events on those dates. They're just part of the structure that's already been given to us. So this structure here, Colin gave us this structure, right? He's the one who compared uh, the prophetic mirror with, as he says, Raphi and Paneum, right? So, so all we did is look at the, the literal time that, that's there, but we're not saying that anything has to happen on January 11th, 2023. That is, the symbols there of 46 and 19 uh, could relate to something else completely different. All we have is a witness that these dates are part of a structure, but it does it's not predicting an event. And, and that needs to be really clearly understood that when we do this, we're not time setting and we're not accusing anybody of time setting when they put a date in the future. Unless you would say, on this date, I believe that this is going to happen and that, you know, that's going to be a test for everybody or something like that. Then I would say, well, that's kind of time setting because we've always been wrong. And I think that we must expect that it's not until those events pass those that we're connecting with these dates. You know, we're connecting November 8th, the midterm election. And then we have the structure, but we know that after that time passes, then we may understand what those dates meant or what they were referring to. But to say that we can know because we put a date in the future, that such and such an event must happen. We should have learned from July 18th. We can't do that. We should have learned from November 27th. Yeah, but that was a date. And what's being put in the future with Colin studies is not a date, but a symbol. And it's not our uh, anyone from Adventism who is saying November 8th, that's externally established by independent actors. Right, and so that's exactly what we're doing. Is we're that is the event as a symbol, yeah. right? So this is a symbol. It's nothing to do with dates. But dates are symbols, right? It's nothing to do with dates except as, as um, yeah, but, but the time spans, you see, the time spans, what are those symbolizing? Like, I'm not, I'm, it's just me probably. I'm not privy to know what 718 stands for, what 781 stands for. Well, is it part of the theme of, of South versus North? 718 is July 18th, right? Well, I understand that, but is that is that in the same theme as King of the South versus King of the North? Right? Because well, that have, goes, we have July 8th. What did we say July 18th was? On what level? Many different levels. I mean, looking no, at all no. the information. But well, we said July 18th was Panium, right? So July 18th is a symbol of Panium. We would have to agree with that. Okay, so then you're connecting uh, the symbol of Raphia, 19 and 46, uh, the 65 days, with Panium. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay. That's what the, that's, so, because that's what the symbols tell us. So when when I do, when we do this, we're not mm -hmm. all we're doing is analyzing. This is just analysis. We I didn't put the date November eighth there, right? 
Colin did that. But when he did exactly. that, and he put the 60 well, the days at each end, and he divided them, even though he's not giving literal days, but he divided them as 19 and 46 and 46 and 19. He, al he also wrote these dates out. He just didn't put them on his chart, but he said he already figured out those dates, right? So all I did, I just analyzed them. So again, I wouldn't say that we could predict that anything's gonna happen on December 24th or anything's gonna happen on January 11th. I actually wouldn't expect anything to happen on those dates. All we have is symbols. And, and we can see that 718 is a symbol of July 18th. 780 days is a symbol of July 18th. Um, 781 days is a symbol of July 18th because 71 times 11 equals 781 and 187 is equal to 11 times 17. It's a mirror, right? So we can see it, it gives us a mirror, which is what this is, the prophetic mirror, right? That we're mm -hmm. using. Yeah. But how how can it how can it be a mirror when it goes from the beginning of the 65 day symbol to the middle of the 65 days or yeah the middle okay of the 65 day symbol that's not an actual mirror okay so think about the prophetic mirror um, the yeah. prophetic mirror begins in 742 BC and ends in 1860 mm -hmm. do we have mm -hmm. any spans of time that begin on different places in like 19 years and 46 years. And so do we have any spans of time that we count that begin in 742 and in 723 and in 677 that end on different places in connection with the 65 days on years on either side? I don't think that we have um, if we look at the 65 and break it, like, because it breaks down into the 19 and 46, mm -hmm. I don't think we have any spans of time that go from the beginning of the 65 days to the middle, like to the end of the 46 days. Okay, well, we do. So, um, okay. so we, we've already connected those uh, before. So that's, okay. so if you wanted to look at this and you wanted to put the years, you put 742 BC, 723 BC, 677 and then you would put 1798 1844 and 1863 right correct correct now we connect some of these but in different ways right so we don't just have the 22520s and and that's it we have a whole bunch of other connections that we have done um and Stephen has done a lot of these to connect these different dates so but do we have something then specifically that connects say the middle of one with the beginning of the other or the end of one with the middle yeah. of the other yes that's what i'm saying okay so okay. You're, you're just not familiar with this with the structures of the sabbatical cycles and the jubilee cycles that we did right and so, do those do those tie into the theme of mm -hmm. of whatever because yes. that's whatever what the topic 520 is, is about it's about the fact that they didn't keep the sabbatical rest of the land. Correct. Right. So, so yeah, mm -hmm. so there's way more complexity in the prophetic mirror than our just our simple drawing of the prophetic mirror. It actually connects all of the histories all the way back to Abraham leaving Haran, all the way right. to mm -hmm. Kurtan. Okay. So, so we've done this in multiple ways. So, but we can't put everything here. And we can't address everything here, but yes. But why would we? Because why would we though? Because what what is it actually showing us or telling us? Okay, so let's let's. I take mean, when you look at the line of the twenty five twenty, with you know the northern and the southern tribes and captivity and all that, you can see the prophetic mirror clearly, and you understand what the theme of that line is, and the king and the 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 north versus the south on one side, the south versus the north on the other side, but. When we start looking at the sabbatical, um, I know that you're talking about the spans of time to do with sabbatical uh, references. What is that telling us? I mean, yeah, there could be numbers that are interesting or you know typical numbers. No, that's that not we've seen before. But okay. is it telling us something? Are you familiar with the 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 two the seven times two fifty two? This one's got a typo here. 
Seven times two fifty two years. Are you familiar? Yeah. With well, not not at that diagram. I'm seventeen twenty one to seventeen ninety eight. No, I'm not really that familiar. I know the two fifty two, the twenty five twenty, seven okay. times. Yeah. So so from thirty four A D, you have two hundred fifty two years to the beginning of the twelve sixty. Or this, pardon me, this mm -hmm. is five hundred four years. This this is actually not a great chart. This was a working chart. So so you have 504 years, which is two times 252, and this is five times 252. So from 34 AD, you have 504 years for the persecution of Christians by pagan Rome, and then 1260 years for the persecution of Christians by papal Rome. Um, I'm gonna find a better chart than this one because this doesn't have everything in it. So, so, so Stephen and I had done this back in 2016, um, but I'd figured out this 1,764 years um, back in 2013. So I'd presented the first, the latter part um, back in 2013, uh, or 2014, pardon me, uh, when we did the first camp meeting at Waberman. Right. Mm -hmm. And I presented this, but uh, here's the chart that Stephen and I had done. Uh, it's got a few errors on it because I expanded this. So I'll just move this over. So so if we go here like this. Uh, and we put this here. What you have is the death of Jacob. This is Jacob blessing his um, 12 sons. Right. And there's going to be 252 years to the conquest of the promised land. Okay, does that make sense? It's a span of time, like the 2520 symbol right. between those and, two events. Yeah. And then there's going to be 756 years till Hoshea's captivity for the 2520 starting for northern Israel. And that's going to be three times 252. Mm -hmm. Right? OK, yeah. And then, and then from 723 to 34 A.D. is going to be another period of three times 52, 252. Mm -hmm. So this whole period here is seven times 252 from Jacob blessing his sons to the stoning of Stephen, seven times 252 mm -hmm. years. And it's in a structure of three, three and one from 34 A.D. It's a structure of two and five mm -hmm. right so two times 252 and five times 252 and i'll just get this yep. part back over here so there's 1798 so so this structure as we've shown this comes from the story of joseph actually so there was a paper done by um johannes koletsky back in april of 2010 and and that paper was sent to me uh um in um in 2016 when i was at the school of the prophets when i was working out this chronology and and he understood the connection between the story of joseph and the years of plenty and famine uh was connected to this 2520 here uh for northern israel going from 723 to 1798 and after working through that Stephen, Stephen asked me the question, he says, what if we count back from 34 AD, where do we come to? And we come to the end of the prophetic mirror in the story of Joseph that Johannes Koletsky marks out. So that's the mm -hmm. death of Jacob. But it's also when Jacob blesses his 12 sons. So we've been going through the book of, well, first Exodus, well, Genesis, Exodus. And we're now in the book of Joshua. And we came to establish this structure here of this 252 years and how it's connected to the jubilee sabbatical cycle so we we've done a lot on this uh study so if you look back at some of the morning studies you'll see some subtitles where it talks about the jubilee structures that will go through this but the point is this is all connected we can't just separate our history from all that has gone before because if we're going to understand what's happening us to us now we're going to have to understand the past. And when, when Colin brings in the prophetic mirror, 
and places it there in connection with what's happening now. He's doing that. And that means in order to understand what he what those things are showing us, we must take the past for that information. We can't just we can't just guess. That's not that's not what we're supposed to do. We have to take the time to study. And and, and that's what Colin's doing. He's just throwing it out there from for the conversations I've had with them of what he sees, what he believes was given to him. And I believe it was given to him too. So I don't argue against what Colin sees as his biblical arguments or what Odilio has presented. It's all part of this structure. What we can't do is ignore all of this information that's been given to us over the last, basically, you know, ever since this movement began, but specifically since... But 2013 regarding chronology. Okay, why? Why can't we do that? Because then we're ignoring what God has done. We would be basically uh, rejecting light. Because if God gave us all this light regarding the prophecies in the past and those that understanding of the light was what gave us the predictions regarding July 18 in the first place, that even gave any witness to the fact that November 9th meant anything. If we ignore, if we ignore what God has given us, then we're going to just walk in darkness. We know. Okay, but November 9th is not on the is, line. What's that? That Colin is, sorry, November 9th is not on the line that Colin is presenting. Neither is any of the factors of the sabbatical cycles, the 252. None of that is part of that line. It's, it's, um, it's a line of symbols based on Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 11, verse, you know, those things, and right. Revelation 17. So I don't, I don't, I don't really know why, I mean, maybe it does, maybe there are some of these numbers and these lines and these structures that you're showing us now that do fit in to what uh, Colin is presenting. Okay. But I, yeah. I don't, I think on faith, I can see it. I can see what his, he's presenting. And I can see what I need to be looking for in terms of waymarks for future events. And so, uh, and, but I mean, this is great if in the next, what, two weeks or two months or whatever, you know, I can, you find out, you can present how all of what Colin is presenting also ties into all these time spans that have already been studied and presented, but I don't need that for faith. I mean, it's great, but um, yeah, so I don't know. I, well, it's, it's very. I, I, I need it. I need it for faith because if my faith okay. is based upon rejecting things that God has told us that we need to understand. So, for instance. No, I don't think it's a rejection. No, I, I don't. I don't think it's a rejection. I'm not rejecting anything well, of maybe. what you've shown me ever, right? But I'm. It neither does what you're showing me negate what I'm seeing in this chart that okay. you have up right you now. You see on this chart here, Colin puts the prophetic mirror there. So when mm -hmm. he does yeah. that, that means he's including everything that the prophetic mirror is showing us and that it's giving us light about the line that he just put under it, right? Absolutely. I, I know the 2520 is there. And so all of that is like, a, it's like focusing. It's becoming more and more into focus. In my understanding, I guess that's a, how I would present an analogy about it. It and it's wonderful if you can, you know, see where the 252 and the factors of the 252 tie into this line. For me, I mean, I guess it's fantastic, but I don't need it because I already accept the 2520. Yeah, I know that in Isaiah chapter seven okay. verse eight it talks about 65 years, so okay. I've so, already got it. No, I, I, I'm rejecting anything. Yes, I'm you not are. rejecting anything. Okay. Oh no, From I'm not. Perspective you are. I don't. <laughs> here's, just let me explain it. Let me explain it better. What am I rejecting? Information. How am I rejecting? Well, if you're but, not taking the information. What about faith? Let, let me finish. I believe in the 2520. There's the 2520. There's the 65. There's Daniel 11, north and south, south and north, Panium, Raphia. Okay. So this to me is the salient with? condensation. Uh, of of everything that we've all, you know, studied okay, so as information what, what up until then. What will you do when Trump is not reelected? 
Well, I mean, as, as with everything, I'm still going to believe that there's a God. I'm going to believe in the scriptures. I'm going to believe in the spirit of prophecy. And but, I'm going to believe that man is fallible. And, you know, if in fact you, that does are happen. You, are, you going then, to have, are you going to have the information to understand where you are? So at that point, yeah, I would have to look back retrospectively, just like the Millerites did, you okay. know, which we did at, at July 18th, right? We look back retrospectively. Have you determined why July 18th was a failed prediction by looking I, back I, retrospectively? I did it before July 18th. And did you know that it was going to be a failed predictive prediction? I I, that's before? what I presented. I presented that the symbols mm -hmm. of that line showed that July 18th could be a failed prediction. I sent that to Jeff on April 26th. Okay. 2020, I can send you the email if you want to see it. So my view was, based upon the line of failed predictions, it appears that July 18th will not be fulfilled as we expect it to be. But mm -hmm. I wasn't going to go against the movement. So I sent it to Jeff. I expected him to present it. I, I did a study, a Zoom study, and gave him my notes. And he said he would watch the study and read my notes. He never got back to me, but he was presenting at the end when he presented his morning studies before Daniel started his. He started to hint at this idea that that it could be a failed prediction. He asked about it, but he never ended up bringing in any of the information that I had shared with him. So when July 18th was approaching, I still felt that we had to warn Nashville because all of the evidence showed that July 18th was this significant date. Even though I had information telling me that it could be a failed prediction, I knew that if it was a failed prediction, that that would explain what I had been teaching for years regarding our line being typical, especially in 2017. So in 2017, what Samuel Snow's letters told us is that our line was typical and that we are Samuel Snow, right? Okay. So this is what Samuel Snow's letters told us. And without that information, I would have made the same decision that the people who made the December 6, 2020 declaration made. I would have just abandoned everything. But the thing is, God had been witnessing to me all along with these dates that, that one is, that that event would fail, but that fit in perfectly with my understanding of all of the information that he had given me. So then when I tried to share that with people like Larry Lesher, Larry Lesher brought up these irrelevant arguments, something about basically Josiah Litch or, or Hiram Edson, pardon me, you know, had this vision the next day. And so they all knew the reason for their failed prediction, but, Hiram Edson's um, vision, cornfield vision, wasn't generally known until uh, 1905. So Adventists didn't but know I, it. But except to the Millerites, you mean. But the Millerites were the ones that would be examining why their prediction failed. Yeah, but, but the Millerites and Adventists didn't know about it. That is, the only people that would have known of Hiram Edson's cornfield vision uh, might have been... Um, well, I know that uh, uh, Crozier knew of it because Crozier was a friend of his. And, and maybe James and Ellen White might have known of it. But Adventists okay. in general did not know of it. That is, it wasn't the reason that Adventists then immediately understood the reason for their disappointment. That is, it wasn't until 1846, in February of 1846, when Crozier's article was published, that they even had an explanation for the disappointment. Um, but even then, it wasn't widely accepted. So to think that on January 18th, everything would be understood by everyone was unrealistic. But I understood January 18th already before January 18th. That is, I understood that if it did not occur, and I presented that on January 17th, you mean July 18th, right? Oh, you yeah. mean July. Yeah, he means yeah, July. July 18th. July 18th. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. Look at January 6th in front of me here. Right. Um, right. So, so on, on July 17th, I presented that evening. Uh, I again presented the, the line of failed predictions. And then I went over that again on the 19th. So, okay. So, so what you're saying is it's, but that's what the Millerites did. They looked retrospectively to, but they had time had to pass to gather enough information to yeah. do that, to figure it out. Yeah. So July 18th, you were a bit more proactive with that or predictive of the well, failing God prediction. Was, God was more proactive. Right. So it, it, you okay. know, God, God gave us all the light that we had regarding July 18th and the lines. Okay. These, were, these were all actually fulfillments of prophecy. So the, the date that I figured this out was already predicted. And I, and I found it on, on the date that was predicted. So, mm -hmm. so we had a prediction that I had made regarding an increase yeah. of light. And on that date, I was given an increase of light regarding the failed prediction of July 18th. Mm -hmm. So Okay, so, so then that's yeah. why you're trying to tie this in to this study, to call in study, well, to, it's not to see if there problem. is okay, so any failure? No. I wouldn't say that. Okay. I'm. So what we're doing is we're just studying all of the light that God has given us. That's what we're doing. It's not a matter of, of trying to do anything. It's a matter of doing what God asked us to do. So the Millerites, of course. after 18. Of course, but how? Yeah. How is it that, I mean, when you look at all the lines and everything, and like, I guess what would be really helpful is because you're the one that was able to predict a couple of months ahead of time. And even on the day out, okay, this is what has come to pass. I knew it would happen, um, or I suspected it would happen. And so, what was it that showed you um, that it would that it might fail? And so, looking at this prediction now, you know, instead of just saying it's not going to be Trump, it's going to be a failed prophecy. Why not say, can we apply what happened with the Millerites and what happened with July 18th, and kind of distill the reasons? the the common theme as to why and then look and see if those signs are there instead that's of applying everything but that's what you're doing what is applying like you're looking at the seven last caesars the seven kings of israel the seven kings of judah all these things and it's it's like exactly. really hard to pick out okay. what you have discovered as the salient information it's too much information it's not salient enough okay have you watched all of the presentations? I don't have time. I just, I'm sorry. I just don't have time. Okay. Well, then I don't know what I can do because we well, just take the because, information as it's given to us, right? So, okay. I mean, it's, it, now, what, what I'm saying is, do, as a teacher, I don't want to duplicate what you've already done, right? I don't want to duplicate it because you've already done it. So, as a teacher, as the one who's experienced it, I mean, maybe you, you yourself want to go through all those different steps. That's up to you, right? Um, but if you've experienced it, you, you've studied Millerite history, you know the letters of Samuel Snow, you've you studied the July 18th, you knew ahead of time why it wouldn't work. So it should be, I don't know, I would think that I wouldn't have to watch, I don't know, a hundred different hour long well, studies yeah. in order to come to the same conclusion. Right. And, and that's kind of my point. You but can't watch the time. So, so what are people doing then to try to address um, what I'm saying? So are people interested in anything that I'm doing in the movement right now? Well, what are people? Why wouldn't they be? Me? What are you asking? Well, so people people don't seem to be that interested in general in looking at these things because it's too much information. That was the yeah. same thing that was being said prior to July 18th, right? That's that's mm -hmm. always been said all the way along the way. It's too much information, right? Mountaintops. We need mountaintops. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, as a teacher, I'm yeah. I'm, distilling, I'm distilling things for everyone, but. Still we don't have, understand. We have, we have this series on the presidents of the United States, and in order to bring all of the lines together of everything that we study, it still takes time. There's no way that I can just um, tell you what I think and that you just have to believe me. You're going to have to see it for yourself 
Okay. And, uh, okay. So what I'm, what I'm hearing you say then is yeah. there no there's no way to repeat or distill the experience, the conviction, the way that you arrived at a conviction. There's no uh, a way to kind of apply that distillation of experience to this current situation, uh, there which is, is kind of what studies oh. on presidents of the United States is a distillation. But we have to come, we have to go through the information. That is, if, if I had to present everything that I've studied, because I've presented it now, it's been, you know, more than two years. So that, that, I've, that we've been doing these, these studies and we were doing the three hour studies, you know, prior to mm -hmm. July 15. Um, so all of that information is there but I'm constantly going over it, constantly reintroducing it, constantly showing the connections. And when it comes to what Colin is doing, he's focusing on certain chapters and trying to draw a conclusion. But I know already, based on what we have studied before, that his conclusion is wrong. And I can show that it's wrong, but I can't just tell you it's wrong. That it, that's not going to. Um, but you've already done that. Well, I have. <laughs> you've already done that. Also, I, I know, but I can't just do that. I have to show the evidence. That's what this Friday night study is and has been. It's showing the evidence point by point, step by step, to show why I think Colin is in error regarding Trump. But I don't think Colin's in error in his his basic assumptions about those chapters. I think he's okay. insight right. from God, but, mm -hmm. I, but, but you can't ignore all of the other insights that God has been giving other people. That is, God isn't leading so, an individual. God's leading a movement. Right. right. If you think, but God does work through individuals. Individuals have to open the door of their understanding, right? They, yeah. That is how God works is through individuals. And yeah. then people in the movement are either receptive, open to it through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, or they're not. Right. And so I, I can speak to that. So, but so if you think that Trump, if you're saying that Trump is not it, then you have, must have a reason. There must be yes. one pivotal reason I have as to why it's not Trump. just one. I actually well, have hundreds prioritize of them. Pri but, Prioritize them. Prioritize them. What is the most salient reason? That is what people need to hear. Because your experience is valuable, but okay. you need to be able to present it in a digestible manner. For, because for when I tried to, to present it, when I tried to present it, I was told to shut up, basically. So people didn't by want what I had to say. Well, by um, initially, it was... Um, What's his name? I'm bad with names when I have to try. It doesn't to matter. I don't think it really matters. Yeah. But, that study, you know. I was I was asking I was asking questions, and and Colin was resistance for answering, and it was um, I can't think of his name offhand. Uh, Huey, right? Are you talking about Brother Huey? Oh, I was there, Theodore, yeah. and, and it was a presentation. Talking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and yeah. if I do a presentation and I, and, and somebody is asking me lots of questions. I welcome that, right? There's, well, you're, you are asking lots of questions too. You're asking us lots of questions, right? Right, yeah. You are asking, you, it, to me, it seems like you yeah. do want to know where our understanding is. Right. Because you right. are asking lots of questions. Right. And, and Colin yeah. had asked some questions and I tried to answer those questions. And then I also asked some questions of my own. And for some reason, Huey thought I was being aggressive or something. I'm not sure why he thought that, because I was agreeing in principle with what Colin was saying. And I was interested in on his answers on trying to understand some points. Do you understand it now? Yeah, I understand his arguments. Yeah. And okay. I've had conversations with him. And, and when I presented, he said I didn't misrepresent his points. He was actually surprised that I understood his points. So, but in order for us to, in order for me, so this is me as a human being, I, I'm very, very careful about how I draw a conclusion. That is, I will spend thousands and thousands of hours on something before I say I understand it. 
that is, I have to know things inside out. Now, I've spent lots of time on this, but not just in this study. But if I was to, and, and it's already happened this way, people think that I'm attacking Colin. Like the study that I did last Friday, it was understood um, that I was accusing him of time setting, and there's all kinds of things that were that Colin addressed on his Saturday night study. But when I talked to him on Sunday, I cleared up. So, so one is I still have never rejected the application of the seven heads in the way that this movement has done them. But I recognize they're an application, and that it's an application in a repeat of history. It's not the application that the Millerites did, but that's been misunderstood. People have think that I just simply rejected it, and that's not the case. And and, and it's important no, to understand. I think, I think you did need clarification, but you know, obviously, the clarification that you would need would be on one level, a level probably different from clarification that I might need, right? Yeah. Um, maybe but, not. Know, I'm not I, sure, but you notice I'm not presenting any in the American group or the Canadian group. And the Canadian group has no, I have no idea studies for a long, long time. So if they want to know what I think about something, they, they either would have to watch the videos or they would have to talk to me, right? Email me, communicate with me and talk with me. But all I can do is do what I'm doing. I can't act differently, that is, I have to be thorough. And, and when I draw the conclusions, when I draw them all together, if people don't know any of the, the background information of why I'm drawing those conclusions, they can easily just dismiss them. And they can dismiss it because it's too complicated, whatever reason they want to give. But that's what God has given us to do. When we look at what happened with the, the midnight cry in Millerite history, that was very complicated. It was not an easy thing. They had just figured some things out about calendars and how they worked. Um, but God empowered those people because they were interested in looking for truth. They had been following the papers of, you know, the Midnight Cry and Signs of the Times. And, and so when the time came, they were able to see that light. But most of those people ended up falling away in the end. And... We just yes, have but we, we wouldn't focus back. on them. We would focus on the ones that remained because they, they needed faith in order to figure out what happened. And I think even when we're the 144,000, we're still not going to have it all figured out. We're still going to need faith. We, it's, still, it's a constant well, repeating thing. Somebody is saying that we don't need faith, but faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So in order for them to have faith, in order for us to have faith, we have to follow what the counsel that Ellen White gave us and she gives us this counsel very specifically because they followed that counsel so there's two things one is they have to come together to study everything out they have to decide uh it basically it's an upper room experience is what they went through they have to set aside personalities and and biases and prejudices and they have to study together and when they couldn't agree they would go separately and study and then come together when they could agree. And the other thing is, she brings out clearly that if a brother differ with you on some points of faith, you know, you're not supposed to belittle him, you're not supposed to make him to be a heretic, but you need to sit down with him. And as a Christian, go over the points because you don't know if you are correct and he is in error. And this is what, what I believe that we should do with everyone. That's why I've had Odilio in my studies. That's why I've had um, Daniel um, Vanderhorst in my studies. People that, and, 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 you know, I've invited Colin to come to my studies and present as well. So hopefully he takes me up on that. But this is what we have to do. It's, it's not, there's not any other option. There is no shortcut. I, I wish there was, but there isn't. Because I don't think anybody's looking for a shortcut. I well, really don't think anyone's looking for a shortcut, but it's a different, it's a line that is very clear in the topic and the application that is being used for it. And whether well, or not other things, everything else ties into it 
is some people might need to have that all those connections in order to feel like they can trust it but well, other I, people may not I think, need all I think that. people want a shortcut I don't think people want to do the work that's my view now I could be wrong but I think when people don't do the work and they don't take the time and they just listen to something that seems to them to be right that in the end they're in grave danger because Ellen White and the Bible clearly give us the counsel of what we are to do. And, and okay. so, so that's, that's my position. And I, and I can't change that. Oh, I, 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 I am. Well, Timothy would agree with you that studying to show you thyself approved is required. Yeah. And I Absolutely. can't change what I'm doing. I'm not going to just give somebody my opinion without giving the studies and, and, and those studies, these studies here we're doing Friday night. If somebody really wants to know, uh -huh. it's an hour and a half, sometimes two hours um, a week. And they could just study those and they're going to get the information that they need. But people need to study on their own as well. So all I can do is do what I'm doing. I can't do anything differently. Yeah. And, I don't want to take away especially when people, people. And especially when people are resistant to actually even hearing what I have to say because I'm I'm a jerk. Right. So the fact that I'm a jerk is just something I have to live with. Right. Because that well, jerkiness that appears that I have just as a, as a result of my personality. No, in there's no evil in, in the fact that I sometimes uh, don't say things the right way. I'm not angry. I'm not hating anybody. I'm not opposed to anything. I don't have some kind of, you know, reason no, no, why I'm trying to attack anybody but people take me that way and there's nothing I can do about it right I can't change how other people perceive me but these truths either they're true or they're not and if and if they are true and people ignore light that God is giving this movement through the various individuals if I was to ignore what God was giving Colin or God was giving Adilio or God was giving Stephen or God was giving Dwight or God was giving Daniel then I would be in grave danger because I would be ignoring light that God has given this movement. He leads individuals, there's no doubt, but as a movement, there isn't one individual leading this movement. There is God leading right. this movement using all these individuals. And we need yes, to listen Theodore, to all of them. Theodore, the point yeah. that I, I mean, I don't wanna take time away and I'm hearing everything you're saying, and I really appreciate you taking the time to say all those mm -hmm. things. And I'm not disagreeing with them, but I'll just go back to my basic, my basic need or requirement is if you're so certain it's not going to be Trump, please explain how that's not true. How is it that you're so convicted about that? Because you must have some reasoning that supports that statement. And it would be very helpful to hear that reasoning rather than just the conclusion that you yourself have come to. Exactly. And that's what these studies are. So these studies are presenting all of that reasoning. And, and well, but there, if you can, if you, you know, when a teacher is, when a teacher, you know about this, about writing papers. When a person writes a paper, they're going to say, I'm going to explain to you the history of the Egyptians and why this army did this to that army. Mm -hmm. And then you go into 500 pages of what happened during that event and then uh -huh. your conclusion just revisits the first paragraph so it would be like you're making a statement oh, that's what i did at the very really... beginning so that's what i did at the beginning oh so okay so you're talking of, this, about... of this series of studies i laid out first what we were going to do in the second study i explained some of the reasons why colin was incorrect in, in it his wasn't conclusion. colin it wasn't colin Anyways, the what do you thing mean is, Colin? It, okay, well, that's that's something else. But no, you, I haven't heard. I have not heard what your reasoning is for saying flat out it's not going to be Donald Trump. Please explain. Without taking, like, we only have until November. That's only a few months away, right? So, I mean, you must have a pivotal point of reasoning. A yes. statement even that well, well i went i went really through that in earlier studies so the basic the basic principle oh. is that colin's wrong about uh alexander and applying him uh, to trump that doesn't come in that doesn't come into it at all from my understanding alexander doesn't come into this at all it's all
not about the kingdoms, not the historical kingdoms of Daniel 2. Right, but, he said, because can is, I say something? Yeah. Okay, when you did the same uh, one, except you did it, you went into history and found they did it with the uh, popes. Mm -hmm. They did not bring Greece into it. It was all about the popes. This is all about the president. So I don't understand why you can't understand that. Like, if that was right, why is this not right? I don't understand. No, I, I'm not disagreeing with that. So I, I, I'm not sure what you mean. So what she's saying is that this, I think it was Tess and Parmender, whoever did a study on the popes, right? Yeah. But Greece didn't come into it. I understand. Like, maybe you did it. But okay. I, understand, yeah. I understand it's the president's. Okay, so Greece doesn't so, come into it. That, that's my point, is Greece doesn't come into it. So, and it doesn't that, come into the exactly study. That's so. exactly my main point, is that you can't go, what Colin did is he wanted to say that the mighty king, uh, or a mighty king, so this is Daniel chapter yeah, 11, 11, right? And he two. says this is Trump, right? And a mighty king shall stand up and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So he says that's Trump. But that's mm -hmm. not true. Yeah. Because and Xerxes, the reason and Xerxes the reason he's saying that yeah. is be, the reason no, no, the reason he's saying that is because in Daniel chapter 10, verse 21, is the angel is telling Daniel, I'm going to show you specifically the the the, the I can't remember the exact word, but it's like the applicable, uh -huh. the information that you need to know. As is written in the scriptures of truth. Yeah. Right. And so this I mighty king is a, a reference back to yeah. one and two, the mighty king that's referenced there. And he has a multitude. I think it's verse 11, whatever. He has a multitude with him. So I, that's I, his point. That's what he's saying is that it's. I, I understand it is, this point. It's not a problem of understanding okay. his point. It's just that Trump yeah. is typified by Xerxes, right? And Trump stirs up all against the realm of Grisha, correct? And we have in the book of Esther, Trump doing that. That is Xerxes doing that, right? And it's a type of the Sunday law that's going to come in the book of Esther as well. But in chapter one, you're gonna have Trump stirring up everything against Greece and he's going to lose, right? He's going to be defeated. Chapter one of Esther. Yeah, chapter one of Esther and chapter two uh, and onward, right? So he's going to come back from that defeat, and he's going to get uh, after a bit of a time, he's going to get married to Esther, right? So the story of Esther, and then that's going to typify the Sunday law as well, right? Well, that's not part of. That is not something that Colin has addressed. I'm not familiar with him addressing that. I realize, that I realize he hasn't addressed it. So this is why we're so going that. back into all these histories, because we're saying that the kings of Persia are typifying the presidents of the United States. So that means we have to go back to what the Bible tells us about the, the kings of Persia. Well, I think what Daniel chapter 11 is talking about is a sequence of kings up until a mighty king, and then discussing that mighty king. But, and that, his, mighty, the context, yeah, but that mighty the context king. Of but that mighty king is not the United States. That mighty king is Greece. Because Greece is I, going to. Okay, come that's in. you're saying, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Greece defeats Persia. So you can't have. Of course. Exactly, yes, but that's be Greece. Okay. So, okay, now I understand. I understand where you differ with this. Yeah. You're saying that the mighty king is not Donald Trump, it's it's Alexander of Greece. Okay, so that is something oh, that that's historically. So that means that Persia gets conquered I know. by Greece, right? I know. United I know. States historically, conquered by United States gets conquered by Greece. Yeah, absolutely. And who was the yeah. president when that happened? Trump was defeated by Biden. Right, exactly. So that that's right. my point. so Trump, Trump was the mighty be, king. But then he Trump was the mighty, mighty king. But it doesn't say the mighty king. It's our mighty king. And that was referenced as the Battle of Raphia. And, and then a few verses later is the Battle of Panium, where he comes back. But that's not what it says here. 
So if you're going to go by the scriptures, you can't you can't make the mighty king be Trump. Because it's a um, mighty king. We can't do that. So I, I understand now where the difference of understanding is occurring. Well, that's one of them, right? But 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 based on what the Bible says, Persia gets conquered by Greece. When it gets conquered by Greece, that's the end of Persia, right? And that's that's why it goes from Xerxes to Alexander. It doesn't go through all of the other kings of, of Persia. We're, but we're not talking about history. It's not talking about that. It's it's not the history of the wars of the secession of kings of kingdoms it's in the context of worship so i think there has to be some more clarification regarding well i'm not how gonna... does the... yes me. that's how what i'm the... doing so that's what i'm doing now so all of these studies are a clarification of all of this right it's not, it's not so... talking about that at all what but you're it... talking about is not talking about that at all not true. No, because all of this is connected. If, if we don't understand the whole picture, we can't look at some detail and just understand what it means. You have to look at well, the whole picture. The, the Bible, I, I, the cannot, Bible. I cannot believe something unless I can see the whole picture. I understand that. And that's right. valuable. That's, that's why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and not something else, mm -hmm. because I yeah. study. And I bring together everything in the Bible. I don't just take some verse that says, you know, they shall be tormented forever and ever and say, well, that means that, you know, they're going to be tormented forever and ever. Right. I can't do that. Yes. To follow Miller's no. rules. That is, Miller says Got we it. have to bring together everything. And that's what we're doing. So I'm following Miller's rules. Why? why does the angel in the at the end of chapter 10 say, I will show you that which is noted. Right. Like, and that's why that's not what everything. The angel does not say, I'm going to show you everything. He says, I'm going to show you that which is noted. And that's what we're looking at, what's noted in the scripture of truth. That's everything well, that's written in the Bible. That's I'm what not sure that means. my understanding of that which is noted is the mountaintops, no. not everything. No, that's... Uh, what would be your basis for drawing that conclusion? Well, just the way the angel said to Daniel that I'm going to show you that which is noted, the notable things, the things that you have to pay attention to in the scripture of truth. It just that means which is noted. Right? All that means is why didn't he just written down. show you this? Noted why didn't he just say no, you're, you're doing um, you're making a mistake in taking an English word and applying a different meaning than the word means. It just means a record. So what's in the okay. record in the scriptures? It doesn't mean the mountaintops. It doesn't mean something that's noteworthy. It's, they could have said in the record in the scripture of truth, because that's what the word means. It doesn't mean what you're saying it means. That's equivocation. So you have to- Well, use I'm willing to see your point. I'm definitely willing to see your point. Yeah. Um, but- I, I'm just recognizing from the outside looking in that the light that Colin has been given that he is sharing is showing that the mighty king is uh, of that one verse, verse 11 of chapter 11, is verse the same three mighty of chapter king. 11. Or you're saying all the way over to chapter 11, the king of the, the, king of the north here. So, so one of the things we have to do, king of the, south. Yeah, the king of the south and the king of the north. So one of the things we have to do in, um, in this study is we do have to come back to chapter, chapter 11 of Daniel and understand this chapter differently than I we think have. That is the point that needs clarification now, not all these other spans of times and, you know, all these other timelines and um, yeah. You know, all, all those other numbers, uh, Theodore, okay. because this is the like, point of contention that needs to be addressed. And right now, it's like it's like you're sweeping it under the carpet and it's like, OK, look at the chair, under... look at the chimney, look at the TV, okay. look at the look at everything else. But don't look under the carpet. I okay. want to look under the carpet. 
okay, how am I sweeping it out of the carpet when I'm addressing what Colin's study is and I'm showing witnesses well, you know, that his study is correct? Sorry. I'm so sorry, but I have had to bring you to this point. What point? That this is the point where, where there's difference of understanding. And I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong. I'm just saying there's, we need to, you know, ask God to help us all understand and clarify this understanding. And, and how whatever. does God help us understand? Pardon me? How is God going to help us understand? Well, because... No, just tell me what's the means by which he helps us to understand. Well, first of all, first of all, we need to identify what is it that what people understand differently. And why does this person understand it this way? Why does another person understand it a different way? Understand the differences of conclusion. Like, why did you come to this conclusion? Why? I need to understand why I came to this conclusion. The very same as I need to understand why another person came to his conclusion. Okay. I well, need to understand both points of view. It's perspective taking. I need to understand why you believe what you believe, where, why you got that conclusion. What were your logical sequence of steps? What was your reasoning from cause to effect? What was Colin's reasoning from cause to effect? Mm -hmm. And I need to understand my own reasoning from cause to effect. And the scripture of truth should guide us. But that's what I I'm can't doing. do it. I, I, I don't know, understand why you don't think I'm doing that. Because that's exactly... Well, I'm glad that I'm so happy to hear that, really. And I believe that that is what you truly believe you are doing. If you but watch the way that study, I learned, pretty, it, it, but listen, listen. But I'm different than you. I'm not you. So I can't I know, and I'm, do for you what, you what you can do for yourself. I can't do that. All I can do is be me. And, and, and me is yeah. going through things thoroughly. And, and I can't be yeah. somebody else. I've tried. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. I'm only me. This Don't try to do that. Be yourself. But right. the way that you learn, Theodore, is by looking at the trees. The way that I learn is by looking at the forest and a few trees in the forest, but not all the trees. Well, actually, I just need I, to see the actually, I'm a forest guy. The only thing that has made me look at all these details is that I care about mm -hmm. being accurate. So all of this is against in a certain sense, my nature. That is, I'm not a detail person. I'm a broad, sweeping brush person. As, a, as an so artist, you, I was an impressionistic artist. So I was not, I was not a realistic artist. Why? Because this okay. is what God's telling us to do. I'm just doing what God tells me to do. I don't... Where is God telling you? How is God telling you to do that? Because this is what he's been showing us all along. The t all along. Okay. So okay. back in 2013... I was, for lack of a better word, possessed in looking at this, these, these dates. I had to solve the problem of the 2520, the chronology of the I know, 20, I remember. And the prophetic periods. It's not something mm -hmm. I chose to do. These are things that I was compelled to do. And I know. And I, I couldn't stop it. So all through this whole time, all I've been doing is doing what God tells me to do. And when I look at Colin study, I can see that God's leading him. When I look at Adilio studies, I can see God's leading him. God's leading Stephen. Right. God's leading Dwight. Right. So, so right. I'm not rejecting any of of God's leading in these individuals. Let me ask this. What I do know. Let, let me, me finish. Ask. Let me finish. So, okay. what I believe sure. is that each of us are given a different piece of the puzzle, and in order to see the picture, we have to bring all of the pieces together. Not one person has all of the light that we need as a movement. God is clearly showing that this movement has to come to the upper room. In order for us to accomplish the task that God wants to give us, we need to be truly converted and reconciled to one another. Right. And fully supportive and of one another. And, in and the that's upper room. what I've been doing the whole time. But people accuse in me. In the upper room. Yeah. Let me ask you. Yeah. What, in the upper room, was there any misrepresentation? Did one disciple misrepresent what another disciple said? No. Or so was trying to misrepresent what people say. And let me ask you this, Theodore. Was yeah. God leading you to put up an email from Colin as if it was the very yeah. first okay. salvo between the two of you? Or was there an email from you prior okay. well, to that? Colin and I have already resolved that. 
So that Colin his and I have already resolved that. That was a misunderstanding. That was a misunderstanding. So Colin misunderstood what I was doing and what I was asking. And well, I'd like to hear him say that. Yeah, well, he'll tell you. He'll tell you tomorrow. Because I don't think God would lead anybody to misrepresent what another person is saying by putting up an email and saying that he emailed me first when clearly he was responding to your email. Okay, so, so that I went was a through, I went this with Colin on Sunday night. We went through my, and I went through my uh, presentation. And I, at first, I didn't know what he was talking about. Uh, but then when I went through it, I saw what he was, because, I, because I'm not a detailed person, I, I left out some information. But that wasn't to misrepresent. I don't even know how that's a misrepresentation. I thought you said you weren't a detailed person. That's what I'm saying. I'm not a detailed person. I'm, okay. I'm, a broad, I'm a broad brush person. So when I presented it, I left out information that I didn't think was very important. Right? That is, all I was bringing up is that, that Colin had been at my study, and now I'm getting this email. I, I never explained about the fact that we had had an email exchange in there. To me, it wasn't important. No, you didn't. But right? you had but been at his important. study, and, but, but you important. did portray his email as the, as, um, the initial email, which it wasn't. And that did bear, I, I, that did I, make I, a difference. But, but to me, that didn't really matter, right? Oh, really? And, and also, Aran says it was discussed before the start of the meeting, which I didn't realize that it wasn't recorded. But, but this is the point. So when I was presenting, I just didn't think it was an important detail. Now, Colin did, because he thought it was a misrepresentation of something. But it took me a while to what? figure out why it mattered to him. Because to me, it wouldn't okay. it really matter, right? So there was no, there was no, I wasn't trying to misrepresent what was being said. I was just Understood. I was just presenting things in a simple way, leaving out some details. And and the other thing that he thought is he thought that I had asked a question something to the effect is it fair for him to send me this email? And the question I was actually asking was it fair for me to look at this email? And, and read it. I was actually questioning my fairness, not his fairness. And when I said that, Dwight said something to the fact, absolutely not, because Dwight understood it in the same way that Colin did. Right? right. He, thought, he thought that I was questioning the fairness of sending me this email, which I wasn't. Yes. I was questioning the fairness of me examining the email. That's a very important point to straighten out. Thank you. Right. Me and Colin straightened it out. So. So, so that was, so nothing, in, I, one thing I will not do that, that I'm actually, I find abhorrent is to misrepresent an argument. When I look at an argument, even when I'm presenting my own argument, I want to look at all the weaknesses of what I'm saying. And if I'm looking at another person's argument, what people will often do, they look at somebody else's position on a point is they will look at the weakest parts of an argument and ignore the strong parts because what they're trying to do is tear down what somebody else is doing. That is, they're in a dialogue you know that, environment. I and understand. And you know, that is that is not what God wants us to do. We right. are to and look for truth, not to, to tear down and right. to look for truth. So that is an important precedent to set within each of ourselves, to look for truth first and foremost, in the perspective of the other person, right. not to look for this point is wrong, that point is wrong, etc. That's a debating spirit. Right, which I never have. Right. That is, I can't actually do that. It's it's against my nature to to get into a debate and try to tear down somebody's argument. So when I was discussing with Colin on all the studies that I've been in regarding the presidents of the United States, what I was presenting was my support for what he was saying. That is, I saw that God had given this him this information, and I saw this was really important that we understood it, but there were some questions that I, I wanted to have at that time so that I could understand fully, because I could see right away, as soon as I came into the study, I didn't actually have to listen to much to see the sensibleness of what he was saying. 
but I had reasons why, and there's still other reasons, but those reasons I have to explain. That is, I can't just tell you why. That is, I know. Well, you did, but you did just say flat out, it won't be Trump. And, and people are yeah. shocked as to how you can say that without actually backing and, it up. But, in a but that's salient why I'm way. having the studies Friday night. So I understand. This is my point. I understand. So, so you're saying yeah. that I should have just said, well, I agree that it's Trump, but no. No, so what am I going to say? I'm going to say it's really good, but I don't feel like it's To be totally honest, honest, you would say, yeah, you, but let me finish for a sec. For, first, okay. Rosanna, please. You, To be totally honest, I would think you would say something like, I don't agree that it's Trump. I can't explain it right now, but I'm, I'm going to try to present as to why I think it's not Trump. That's that would be I'm being saying. more honest in just saying it's not. Go ahead, please, Rosanna. Yeah. What I was thinking was similar. Like if you didn't agree it was going to be Trump, then you must have had an idea who it was going to be. Yeah, and that's what I've been presenting. Yeah, but I haven't heard it. But you've been presenting everything but that. You've been talking uh, about thousands of other things except that. Well, I've actually been quite clear that it's not a person. Okay, so am I out to lunch? I mean, I have not come to all the studies. Maybe the other people who are listening right now can enlighten me regarding that. Do you guys have clarity on who it's going to be? It's not a who. That's the point. Or what it's going United, to be. The United States is going to enact a Sunday law, right? We know that. But the eighth is the image of the beast. Of course that, it is. That, right. So the but eighth who are the players? Is, but it doesn't it's, it's matter. Not, the person is not an important point. And that's that's why we're going through this process. Because I want to show Okay, people philosophically, that. it is the image of the beast. Philosophically. That's and in the Bible, if you want to it's not philosophical. Well, it is, why, why are you using then the what is it? It's, because the symbol. People, people, okay, but, symbolically. What Joseph Sorry. Bates said. Yeah. What Joseph Bates said is that the eighth head is the image of the beast. That it's, it's, the eighth head is because originally the pioneers had the heads to be the different forms of Roman government. Okay. Okay. Joseph Bates, ask you this thing, at, you know? Joseph Bates looked at Revelation 13 as exactly the same as Revelation 17, but in a different symbol. That is, Revelation 13 shows two different beasts, but in Revelation 17, we're seeing this woman riding the one beast, and then we mm -hmm. see the eighth head, and that eighth head is that same image of the beast that's made by the United States in chapter 13. But it has to be, okay, so I think I've heard you say that Biden, because he is not, he's a puppet, it's not just him, but he's a conduit through which the globalist, the United Nations, the spiritualist, the dragon power is speaking, representing the King of the North, yes? King of the South, yes. I mean, sorry, King of the South. Mm -hmm. So our symbol for that is Biden. That's fine. So the image of the beast is the King of the North, combining like the, the apostate Protestants of the United States, combining with the papal power to enact a religious decree mm -hmm. and who is our symbol for that who that is that is trump that is what colin is saying that is what my understanding trump, is trump. but but what i'm trying to say yeah. is that in the eighth you don't need the person of trump you need what trump symbolizes but, well we know that we know it's the image of the beast we know that but but, but he's saying that trump actually has to get re-elected re for this to happen and i'm saying that it doesn't have to in order to pass an executive order, somebody has to be in charge. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be Trump. And actually, it can't be Trump. Because? Because Trump. Because, he's not. because when it comes to the symbol of the eighth, it can't be the same person. That is the point. Even though it says it's of the seven, it's not talking about a person. And this is what we have to illustrate, that, that, that the eighth well, is, is not symbolizing one of the persons who becomes the eighth. 
that that's kind it's of talking part. about a king it's talking about a king power a but, king is a kingdom whatever just, i mean trump could be the kingdom but, but if if it is a resurrection of one of the previous seven kingly powers powers but not person well okay but who symbolizes that power theodore you don't what do you mean who who, who's going to sign his name to the executive order that passes the Sunday law? This is the, it doesn't matter who. The, the, the prophecy is not going to tell us the name of that. I'll tell you who it matters to. It matters to people like me who go by, you know, wow, look at this. Biden's the president now. Oh, there's going to be another election on November 8th. Oh, look, Trump is in the running. I wonder if it could be Trump that comes out. Well, Trump, Trump, we know, already has running for the election on November 8th. He has to wait till 2024. But it's it's no he can't i know i understand but there is a mechanism whereby he could go into power and i'm not going to get into all that i know i know the americans the behind it but uh, there yeah, you I go so yeah. don't say 2024 it could happen as soon as january 2023 it could happen quickly yeah right but I'm saying it won't. Yeah. And, and don't resist the idea that Trump could be the symbolic. In the idea, what what makes you think I'm resistant to an idea? Because you're you're saying it's not Trump. You're saying it but can't be him. Have reasons why it's not Trump, and those reasons exist. But what are they presenting? What are they? Well, you told me the image eight, of the beast. Because when the eighth arises, he's never the same person. But the eighth, it, it says in Revelation 17, it's of the seven. Right. How but can how are you reading that? that? Yeah, it's I mean, one of the seven. No. Why are you adding the word one there? Well, is of the seven. Yeah. The eight. He's of. The eight is a. He's yeah. Of the seven. He's not one of the seven. But they're being numbered ordinarily, cardinally, however you want to put it with your number systems. Number one, two, three, four. There, and it says the eighth is of the seven. Right, so we need to understand. How do you take that? Means. I mean, you have to explain how you interpret that, then Theodore, because everyone else on the way planet that Earth would is that say I go, back, that the, I go, I go back to all the other sevens, and then the eights, because we have a pattern in Scripture. If if I'm just going to take my understanding and apply it to a Scripture, then. Revelation 17, you told me yourself, is talking about the beast and the woman riding the beast. The beast is a kingdom. Yeah. Right? Yes. And the woman is the church. Yeah. And that's the image of the beast. Now, the church is always referred to as female, et cetera, et cetera, all that. I'm not going to get, I'm not doing a presentation here. But that is a very clearly talking about the image of the beast. And I don't, you'll have to explain your reasoning as to how the eighth is never of the seven. I never said the eighth is not of the seven. It is of the seven. Well, obviously, yeah, you're confusing me. You're, and I think you're confusing many people by saying these things because okay. people have an understanding that the eighth is a resurrection. We've okay. talked about that. Is Jeff Jesus, presented that. Jesus, no one has argued the, is that. Jesus the eighth of, this, of the seven kings? What? When we look at the last seven kings of Judah, Zedekiah is the seventh. I don't he, know. He's taken over by, according to Elmite, when Zedekiah is killed, Babylon takes over. And then she says, well, because she's interpreting the Bible, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it until he come whose right it is. And that is in Babylon, it's overturned to Medo Persia, it's overturned to Greece, and it's overturned to Rome. And Christ then is the eighth, because he's of the seven. Of the seven does Very not good. mean one of the seven. And I don't know why we would think it does mean one of the seven, because that's that's not what it means. When well, then say, you'll have to have a presentation about eight, that. But, but I have done that. Excuse me? That. Yeah. When, when you, you use that same riddle for chapter two, you bring Rome in. Rome is one that was brought in for the eight mm -hmm. which is of the seven right yes and there's other lines also that colin has brought out that no, show no, that the eight into it. so it's overturned 
from Babylon, Babylon takes the kingship away from is from Judah, right? It's overturned to Greece or mm -hmm. to Persia, then to Greece, then to Rome, and then he comes whose right yeah, it is. Whose right it is. So Hosea Jesus chapter six, is verse Rome two. is not yep. the eight. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the eighth, right? Yeah. He's of the seven. Can we agree with that? That he's of the seven. In order for him to be the eighth, he has to be of the seven. Well, Theodore, yes, but now you're using the logic for that scripture that you're negating in Revelation chapter 17. No, because Jesus isn't one of the kings of Judah. He's not one of the seven kings. He's of the seven. What does that mean? He's a descendant. So you're making an application of Ezekiel chapter, whatever chapter that is in Ezekiel. You're making a chapter, of an application of that to Revelation 17. Because it's it's a pattern of the seven and the eight. Then and, do and that. that because this all is... of the patterns of the sevens and the eights. Given That's the... another different pattern, though. You should do uh, one it, of that. Explain how it's a different pattern. Okay, it's different because that is talking about the kingdom of Christ. That is not talking about the kingdoms of the world. Yeah, but we That's know that, totally different. that they are counterfeit of Christ. Okay, a counterfeit does not mean that, that Jesus is part of both of them. A counterfeit is a complete counterfeit. Someone else is going to come back as Jesus Christ. It's not Donald Trump, but he's going to be riding, the, the beast is, or the papal, yeah. papacy is going to be riding his system. That is going to be the Pope. That is going to be Satan. Who is the counterfeit of Jesus Christ in that chapter of Ezekiel that you're talking about? Jesus Christ is not this is not in Revelation 17 as the eighth. Nobody is saying that. No, that I'm is not, the counterfeit. I'm not, I'm not saying that either. Why would you? When you look because at because you just said you just told me that the eighth in Revelation 17 can't be as the seven because it's not Jesus Christ. No, no because you said it. What I said. Yeah. Here's what I said. So, Jesus Christ is the eighth. He's of the seven kings of Judah, right? So what does that mean if I apply this riddle to Christ and I say that here we have a pattern of seven and this pattern we're actually using, it's, it's one of the basis. It's actually the first thing that Jeff found regarding seven kings was the kings of Judah, right? Yes, but Theodore, exactly. those are historical kings. And you're mixing up historical kings I'm written in history. Okay, Bonnie, I'm not with mixing Ezekiel. up. I'm using the pattern. So Jeff did the same. I know. But, okay. Yes, I understand. Uh, you're using the pattern. But yeah. it, it, in so whatever chapter that, that is, mixing up historical kings. Would this be an anchor? Because what's what's that? An anchor? Anti. Oh, Anti -type. what? Anti well, this would be a type. So, so Christ is a type. Um, the the beast of Revelation is a counterfeit, right? We can agree that the papacy is a counterfeit. It has its own twenty five twenty, for instance, and Christ has his twenty five twenty, right? The true twenty five twenty is the week of Christ, right? So, so what we see here is, um, we see that we have all of these examples, which Jeff initially used. That is, Jeff used the kings of Judah first. That was 2013 when he was dealing with yes, the first seven are... times. And then, he, okay, then yes. he looked at the kings of Persia. And then he looked at the last kings of northern Israel. And all of these, he had the sevens. But he didn't realize that in all of these, you also have the eighth. And the eighth is of the seven. What that means is it's a descendant. It doesn't mean it's one of the seven. So where is that in scripture, Theodore? Where it says he's of the seven. It doesn't say he's in one chapter of the 17? seven. Yeah, it doesn't say he's one okay. of the seven, right? It so says you're saying Rehoboam, seven. you're saying Jeroboam was a descendant of uh, who? He was from the, he was like a servant. He wasn't even a descendant. Like, which king are you talking about? Okay. Is so a we're descendant. talking about the last seven kings of Judah. Jesus is yeah. in the line of the son of David, right? He's of the seven. When he comes, who's right it is, he, he comes because he comes from the line of the kings of Judah, right? Well, absolutely. 
Yes. But, his, but that king of Judah, the last king, Zedekiah, he's going to have his kingdom taken away from him. Mm-hmm. And it's going to and it's going to go to Babylon, and then it's going to go to Medo Persia, then it's going to go to Greece, then it's going to go to Rome, and then Christ comes, and he's the eighth. Right. Fine. We're, yes. We're look at this. Fine. Now that's what Revelation 17 is showing is that this counterfeit is following the same pattern that's given with Christ. Right. So yes. that's what I'm saying. It's not mixing anything up. It's just showing. It that is because all the way through it is mixing it up. No, you're mixing it up. And I'll tell you how, because yeah. that is a counterfeit in Revelation 17. So the eighth is not going to be Jesus Christ. I know. I'm not saying the eighth is Jesus Christ. That's the point. So the eighth and the eighth is a descendant of the Roman power that came before. Right. Right. Yeah. Basically, what your argument is, is that the eighth is a descendant of the seven, not one of the seven. That's the argument. Yes. Because it doesn't. And why didn't you make that clear before? Why didn't you make that clear? Because I have made it clear before. (laughs) To who? In, in the studies that this we're doing on Friday night, about. I mean, okay. you, you're telling me that I have to bring every point in, in the few minutes that I had to talk with in the study that Collins did, that I'm somehow supposed to present what I understand. Nobody wants to hear mm-hmm. what I have to say, right? No, you know? it's okay. I understand. I understand. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Okay. But yes. you need to have these conversations with people. You need to have these conversations so that people can understand exactly what you mean. Now it's becoming clear to me that you believe, you know, I'm not going to reiterate, right? But it is something different than what we have always understood in the past. No. It is something different. Yes, it is. That's that's the point. It is something different. Yeah. Okay. All right. There are some details. There are some details that are different, but these details come from using line upon line. That is, all we have done is we've looked, we've we've gone to the past to understand the present. Don't worry about it. I understand that. But the thing is now you're saying that it's not going to be a person, it's going to be an entity. How is that entity a descendant of the previous seven? Okay. So when we look at, at all these kingdoms, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome Pagan, Rome Papal, and we have an image to the beast, is the image to the beast? similar to the beast is it of the beast well i think i'm getting mixed up with your historical uh, outline sequence that you just mentioned and what's in revelation 17 is a prophetic it's not historical it's prophetic and it's talking about specifically it's talking about those kingdoms and then um the dragon this the threefold union the dragon the beast and the false prophet and then the eighth The eighth is what? You're saying it's an entity. I'm asking you, how is that entity a descendant of those seven previous? I never used it as an entity. I said it's it's not. Well, you said it wasn't a person. What is it? If it's not a person, what is it? It's a image of the beast. It's 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 the it's the threefold union coming together. It's the image of the beast. Very good. And I'm saying, how is that Sunday law going to be passed by the image of the beast? How is it going to be passed? Well, we already know going to be- what White says about it. It's going to be through the the, the United States, uh, through their legislation. And who's going to legislate it? Who's going to write the 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 directive, the executive order? Well, the, whoever happens to be the president then. But he's not- yeah, That's what Colin- But you're saying it's not Trump. Yeah, How I'm do saying- you know it's not Trump? It doesn't have to be Trump. The, the point is- Well, that's not what you said before. Yes, it is. That's what I actually said initially. No. Now, I believe you said it's it not. No, just finish. Let me that finish. It you keep asking me questions. Okay. So first off. I'm just clarifying. I, yeah. But so first off, it doesn't have to be Trump. And, and, and Colin, if he thought about it, would recognize that it doesn't. But, but I'm saying it's not going to be Trump. And, and the reason is when we look at every single other example of the seven and the eight, The eighth is never one of the kings. We don't have a resurrection of a person that's going to be the same person. Even if you deal with the papacy, 
You don't, you don't have to have Pope Pius VI uh, come again into power, right? You would agree with me there. Nobody would say. Well, of course. Right. Of course, okay. nobody's saying that either. And I should say nobody's saying it because there are some people who believe that, you know, you're going to have a resurrection of Pope John Paul II. But well, um, we're not talking about those those right. people. But, but the point it. is, we don't we don't ever make the argument anywhere else that it has to be the same person. We always understood that it's the same power. And that power yeah. is Republican America. Yes, of course, Theodore, but the who symbolizes himself, that? The who person himself symbol? is, is immaterial in the argument. It, 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 it doesn't... It's not immaterial if you live in the real world. It's not. Because this election coming up is Biden will be either reelected or, I mean, you know, like the Democrats will either lose the House and the Senate or they won't. Yeah, Biden they'll, will remain they'll in power or he won't. I, I so think it does come to down it. to people. Okay. Yeah. It's See, I agree. The, the Democrats are going to lose the House. They're going to be in power, right? And and it's going to be Republican America that's going to, in in response to um, all the crazy things that have been ha happening in this world, that are going to bring in the mm -hmm. sun. Okay? Mm -hmm, we, mm -hmm. we have to have a panium. And I think that all the evidence that I brought shows that this midterm election is connected to this panium, right? So I well the, the 46 and the 19 and the king of the south and the king of the north on that chart that's on our screens right now shows yeah. us panium, yes. Yeah, and 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 I've and I've accepted that. So I mm -hmm. I did some chronology and just said said this is correct. What Colin put here is correct. Raphia and panium. This fits the bill. We already have the date there. We can show that it's witnessed by an, anal an analysis of mm -hmm. the spans of time and the symbols that are there. So we can't ignore it. I did that last week. And I said, we can't ignore right. this. But, right. so, but there, is let me no ask you this reason, there is no reason to say that it has to be the person of Trump that okay. does this, right? There's nothing in I'll the bring, that requires I'll bring you a reason. Donald Trump. Okay, what's I'll the reason? reason. I'll give you a reason. Okay. What happened? What it, what is it that resurrects those dull, dead, dry bones in Ezekiel 37? Well, it's prophecy. That's right. Yeah. God's people have to prophesy again. We are to prophesy mm -hmm. again. It is important that we know ahead of time what is going to happen, not when, but what, to the nth degree of detail that we can ascertain. And right now, to me, it's, it's crystal clear that no matter how we argue this, that the, there is going to be a, um, a turnover of power. There is going to be a panium, as we understand it. Yep. The king of the north, as symbolized by Donald Trump, or it could be someone else. Maybe it's some Joe Blow guy in the Republican Party who's going to be then uh, appointed as president, as Speaker of the House and as mm -hmm. president, and he's going to sign the executive order. And it is of the seven because he's in the Republican Party and the Republican Party was part of the seven. And, and this was the point that I made from understanding, even though the Millerites had a different interpretation of Revelation 17, it became very clear that to be of the seven doesn't mean to be necessarily one of the seven. And actually, that's not what, how you would say he's one of the seven. You, you wouldn't say he's of the seven. So, so there, but there's still lots more reasons. So, uh, and that's what I've If you're casting doubt. Study. So some of them I have done already. Some of them are, we still haven't looked at. I've talked about them or touched on them, but we need to look at them in detail because there's no point. Nobody's going to just listen to me. I'm nobody. So, and, and I wouldn't expect that people should just accept what I say. Even in, in the colonist well, study, I'm not saying, well, I say it's not going to be Trump and everybody should just agree with me. There was no sense ever in my my word or my actions or my my thoughts that somehow that if people don't agree with me about something I didn't even give all the support for, that somehow, you know, that they're that 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 that's you know, they're wrong. They just have to accept it. Never, never would I suggest such a thing. So what I did is I began a series of studies, and those series of studies 
are laying out point by point in a methodical way to go through all of the different understandings that we have in the past and in the present in this movement. And as we move towards covering everything, then we should be able to come to some kind of conclusion. My main point is that no one person has all of the truth. And I would not expect that I understand everything. And so we need this movement to come together. We need this movement to study these things together in the spirit of Christ. Right? We need to listen to one another. And, and, and we shouldn't be attacking people's character based upon the fact that somebody like me can be a bit of a jerk when it comes to how I communicate. Right? So, so yeah, sometimes I, I regret you what I... leave yourself open to be taken the wrong way many times because yes. you're not, you're, you, you, you haven't practiced being extremely clear and in, in expressing. And I'm, I'm not saying you have to say you're a jerk. I'm, I don't agree okay, with say, that. Say that I haven't practiced. That, that actually okay, Bonnie, is misleading. I have practiced my entire life. That I believe is, it. Of trying to be as clear as possible. So, so to say that I haven't practiced, that's all I do. That's all I think about when it comes okay. to when it comes to teaching, because that's what I am as a teacher, right? I teach guitar. I teach music theory. All my whole life, it's been able trying to communicate to people in a clear way. Trying to communicate with okay. my dad, who was a little muddled up because he had Asperger's, right? Impossible to communicate listening to people trying to understand where they're coming from but i still i'm always going to put my foot in my mouth because no matter how many times no matter how much work i do i can't see the world exactly the way other people see it now i believe there's also god's providence in some of the things that have happened negatively so i'm not I'm not trying to say that i'm not to blame but i'm saying that sometimes these things that happen God foresaw these things. He knows my intentions. He knows what I'm trying to do. And and I'm trying to bring everyone together. I I yeah. really think that we have to study together. And and people don't won't talk to me. I mean there's people in this movement who will not answer emails and who will not answer the phone. They will not talk to me. Theodore, have you ever heard this expression? And I'm not saying this applies to you. I'm not saying this defines you, okay? But have you ever heard this? People don't care what you know until they know that you care. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, And but how am I gonna make them know I care? So from the outside looking in, and this I believe is why not only Huey, many people had this reaction to your yeah. statement during Colin's presentation. Yeah. Um, my my question to you would be, how can I say to you, how can I bring this to your attention? What, what can I say as a trigger or like as a, as, a, as a sign, as a clue, as a, I don't know, um, as a, as a, not an alarm, but you know, some like a little tweak, like what can I say that would let you know that you're being offensive Nothing you without can actually do. accusing you? Pardon me? There's nothing you can do. No, there well, is. I think a simpler solution is people should just know that sometimes, I'm, and, and people know this about me, they know I'm didactic and pedantic, right? Yes, yes, but Theodore, okay. please. But that's who I am. Because, yes, well, you, it is. You're just going to have to accept me as I am. And if you can't accept okay. me as, my, as I am, then there's nothing I can do about it. Right? I do. I do accept you as you are. And that is why I am asking, asking you this question. Because people get hurt, people get offended, because they are, I am who I am. Roseanne is who she is. Dwight is who he is. Right. We're not like, we're not all like you or like each other. Exactly. Therefore, there is a tendency for you to be offensive without meaning it. So that in love, I want to help you. I want to give you a, okay. uh, I don't know, I have to come up with the right word. But okay. what can I say in love? To let okay. you know you're 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 hurting someone's feelings, you're offending somebody. But okay, here's what people actually 
If people feel that they're hurt by me, they need to follow the counsel of the scriptures. They need to go to me and have communication with me about it. Right? Isn't, isn't that what needs to happen? Because look, I've lived with you know this what? my entire you know life. What? I believe, I really think I really no I think I think that you could change your your perspective you could take the other person's perspective you're oh, capable do. of doing that I do I take but the other person's perspective you get, you get locked into your corner and you make these didactic statements which if you could just take a brush and erase that chalkboard in the moment that would be healing and that is what Christ did he healed these these moments that hurt people when someone is doing a presentation and their mind is focused on teaching and doing all of this, and then they get they get uh, unseated, they get kind of just swept off the whatever they're doing. They're just you know it's like it's very they can't say oh I have to just accept Theodore as he is and let him you know why, why can't they? no I think that what you could do with a with a with someone who loves you and cares yeah. about because they know that you don't intend to do that. You have a point to make. So, you so, so, then they, they, that, so then they know that they shouldn't be hurt by it. No, you need to present that. You need to say, look, I'm, I don't mean to hurt you. Uh, that's what here's I my point of view. I no, that. you didn't. In you that didn't. situation, I didn't. So in that situation, exactly. I recognize there exactly. are moments. So Bonnie, I've lived with this my whole life, right? I've lived with myself my I whole know life. You did. So I know you did, and I think mm -hmm, I've been in that direction. Yeah, so listen, 99.9% .9 of the time, I do it right. 99.9% .9 of the time, right? And who is your coach? Who's your coach? Who helps you in those tricky moments? Do you have a coach? God helps me. God helps me. Good. I help me. Okay. I analyze every time I have a bad interaction with somebody. I think about that for weeks. Yeah. Think but about of how course. I can do it differently next time, right? And guess what? Satan wants to trip you up all the time. And I want to overcome the enemy. I don't want there to be this okay. damage. Right. I want I to nip it in the bud. And I want you to be able to take a healing tack immediately. Exactly. And the devil has yeah. to leave. And I did that in, in, in other situations. I, I actually apologized right away in some of the situations that I was in. You know, I've apologized quite a few times, probably three or four times in the studies. Okay. It's right? more important to do it immediately. As soon as you recognize it, as soon as there's animosity towards you, bam, you should be looking at yourself. What did I do? Did I trigger this? Yeah. And if you have a coach who's an, uh, a, a detached observer who can say, oh, you need to just, you need to just okay. say, just, so Bonnie, you know, no, no matter what. There's because of who I am as a person, I know that there are going to be times that and that's why I don't like doing any of this. Right. I'm an introvert. I'd rather just spend my time writing some papers because in a paper I can weigh my words and I, I can write all that stuff that I need to to uh, to make sure that the person reading isn't going to think I'm a jerk. But you know what? Sometimes when I'm the most careful. People get the most upset. And that's because I can't perceive how people are going to take something I'm doing. And, and it takes me a while to process what's actually going on. Now I understand. Right? So I apologized and, and don't and don't say that I didn't, because I did apologize for all of the situations where I've had problems. I've contacted some people and apologized impersonally to them. Right, uh, which I think is often much better. Some people have not accepted no. any of my apologies. Instead, they they give a bunch of accusations, false accusations about who I am as a person, what I'm planning to do, that I'm some deceptive person, that I'm trying to undermine the truth, that I'm a Jesuit. And don't give them the time. Don't give the devil time to form for them to form those opinions. If okay, you if you can nip it in the bud. I am who I am. So when I'm going to interact, there's so just, does the devil. You know, you know, the devil knows how he can use you. Body, the body. devil knows. Okay. Sorry, but that's, if you want to take it that far, yeah. I understand this, but 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 this is what I'm trying to say: is I am trying to follow God. I'm trying to listen to His voice. I'm being very careful. Uh -huh. 
some of those situations, I spent a great deal in time in prayer before I even went on the Canadian group to talk mm -hmm. and, and, and was very careful in my, but people still responded as if, like to me, I couldn't even understand why people responded the way they did. That, that was the thing that surprised me and caught me off guard. When Daniel Fontenot, you know, accused me of being a Judas, I mean, I, I was just totally shocked. Now, I knew that he was resistant to me. I didn't know why. He thought that I'm somehow don't believe in the Jesuit conspiracy or something. But I was very, very surprised. I was very surprised um, when Huey stepped in because I thought Colin and I were having a good discussion. And, and, I, and to me, it just didn't make sense for me you not don't. to be asking Colin these questions. So what you're doing is you put the whole onus upon me and, okay. and I put the yeah. onus upon me. So I put the onus upon me to do better next time. I can't change the past. You know, Colin said a bunch of things Saturday night that he shouldn't have said. And I've heard a lot of people say things they shouldn't have said. But that's there's no because you've given them me. time. You've allowed the, you've allowed no, no. time to work against you. Yes, you, you have. You have, okay, to, so you have, have to to what have I not done you, that I should have done? What, what I'm I, asking you is what can a person say? What magic word? Can a person say that would twig you to the fact that this person knows who you are, accepts you who you are, but is alerting you, you're, you're, you're crossing a line, you're offending somebody here. And but for the I'm other also people that going were, to offend people who want to be offended. So some people are offended for no reason whatsoever. They imagine things about me. Daniel Fontenot was offended with me because he imagined you're being defensive. Something. What? There's nothing wrong you're with being people. defensive. There's nothing wrong with being defensive, is you're there? Making excuses. No, no, I'm not making excuses. Oh, There's you're in denial. Well, then. Sorry, then I'm trying to help you to make in a loving way. You say you're not. And I'm in letting denial. you know. No, I no, understand. Peter, I'm letting you. Bonnie, Bonnie, you're being completely unfair in your assessment of the situation. I am doing everything I can to communicate with other people, to be kind, to be gentle. To be How has it worked, Theodore? You're in your 60s. How has it worked so far? It works for some people. It doesn't work for others. Not there you go. Everyone should, is going to it like needs it. to work. It needs to yeah. work for the people you care about. It's not possible. It can't. It's not possible. What you're saying is not possible. People then you're denying the power of love. love. You're denying the power that God gave us to love each other. Look, I love accept yeah, each other. I love I love other people, but it doesn't mean that they're going to love me. No matter what I do, there are some people who are not going to love me. I cannot change other people. I can only change myself. And Peter, that's I'm, so offering, you're asking I'm, me, I'm offering a solution, and you are resisting it. Okay, but you're offering me a solution that I have been working on since I was a child. And how is it working? That's what I'm saying is it doesn't work. It's not going to work. There There's you go. Try a different solution. Okay, what's the different solution I should try then? Okay, I would really like to be able to say or just <clears throat> clear my throat or something. And that, that, tr that sends you a message of, I love you, but I can see that this person okay. is being offended. So Please I take a deep breath, don't shout, don't talk fast, lower your voice and try to say something like, I, I don't want to be offensive, I just want to convey my point. Okay. That so, is being sensitive. People need to be handled with sensitivity. And sometimes yeah. all of us, and people who are married will attest to that, that our spouse being the detached observer is the best person to say, you're getting overworked, you're becoming overwrought, you're I becoming never got offensive. overworked, ever. Never got overworked. Well, I've, in any of these discussions, well, I was not overwhelmed. I had no emotion about it. I was just discussing. No, I heard. I heard your voice get elevated. You were breathing heavily. Why, you why were did my voice, voice get elevated? Why did my voice get elevated? And you were speaking quickly, because and you were interrupting. Are, because you keep interrupting you, me. These are the signs. Bonnie, people were interrupting me and trying to talk over me. Nobody just let me talk. Why? Why? You talk over me all the time. Now, part of it is the delay that we have with the internet. So that's going to happen, right? You, you agree there? 
Well, of course, but I'm asking you why. And people, can be why very people, and people can be very offensive towards me, but nobody says anything about it. Daniel said I was a Judas. This is even you know earlier in the discussion, right? He was resistant to me. I was there. Nobody, was nobody, there. nobody ended up rebuking Daniel Fontenot for saying I was a Judas. I made no attacks on anybody's character ever. I've never attacked anyone in any of the discussions as a person. I've talked about ideas. Nobody is, nobody is saying that you have done that, but what Colin did say is that but shut him down. Yeah. yeah, but people have attacked me. You agree, right? Well, in that one situation, people tried to stop you from offending Colin. People have, and mocked, offend mocked, people have mocked me. People have called me all kinds of names. That's not me. That's not Colin. That's not Heidi. Colin, Colin that's did not, Saturday night. That's Colin not said, most of us. Colin said I was being deceptive and subtle, right? You know that. You were there at the study Saturday night. He said I was being deceptive. Yes, he, he was referring to the way that you presented that email. Something. I've, never yeah, accused because, people, I've never accused people of anything. I've only discussed but that. You do. So but, why do, okay, why do people, I can why let, people feel I can shed they some can light attack on me that. as a person? Why do people feel they can attack me as a person, but they, they're not held accountable for that? But I can just discuss an idea that I, that differs with somebody, and 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 I now have to see that I'm some that I've done some great sin. Now, sure, I don't want mm -hmm. to offend people, but the thing it's is, because... I'm always one who is asked to say they're sorry. Why is nobody recognizing their fault? Here's an example, Bonnie. I was in a Sabbath school class. I was teaching a Sabbath school class in Warburg Church uh, back in 2004. And well, during the superintendent remarks, this guy had made some things about judging others, you know, and he was talking about the people who judge other people, right? And I was thinking about it, I said, well, you know, we shouldn't really be judgmental about people who judge others because we may not understand everything about that person, why we consider them judgmental. So anyway, Absolutely. In the pastor study and I was teaching the Sabbath school lesson and this guy's wife was there. And, and all I did is made a comment about that was a really good study that Don did. I really, I really appreciated it. But I said, we also have to be careful that we're not judgmental about people who we consider to be judgmental. Well, the pastor was there, Kiziak at the time, and when this, when this woman heard me say this, she screamed at me, ran out of the Sabbath school room, slamming the door. And I was totally in shock because I was supportive of what her husband had said. I wasn't making a criticism or anything about him. I was adding something to what he had said. Now, who do you think the pastor made apologize to who? Right. I have to That's, apologize I to her. I did nothing wrong at all. Not a single thing. Okay. I understand that. I see that. Yeah. But and it's taken the wrong me. way. This happens to you. Theodore. Theodore. So, it's taken the wrong way. Look. I don't want to talk about this anymore, Bonnie, because you're not getting. It's you're not taken going the wrong way. Listening. You're I'm not just listening. Saying. I'm saying. People, people take it you're the wrong listening. way, right? Look. I did listen to you. No, you I'm have. I'm asking to you about anything that I've said. All you have done. I did. Okay, tell me how. I've said. Me. Okay, because you were you saying did. that you were just trying to um, edify the guy who gave the study, and. Mm -hmm. And that, and rightly so, saying we shouldn't judge people when they judge others, because we don't know why, upon what parameters they're judging other people. And that's correct. But there's a context. There's a context, and I don't think you're sensitive to it. And it's not something that you do on purpose. There you go. There but it you is go. something. So, I agree. I'm not no. sensitive to that context. It's not part of my universe. So exactly. I'm always, I'm always going to be in a situation where somebody is going to be offended by something that I did, right? You agree with me? That's going to happen. I do agree. I do agree because I remember at that one church where you said something after Sabbath, during Sabbath school, and Brother Ralph ran out of the church. He ran to his car. He came back in. He started swearing 
the F uh -huh. word and everything. And he yelled because of something you said. And I, I could tell that it, it was the same thing because you, you, do, you just come by it honestly, Theodore. I understand yes, that. Yes, you do. Oh, so, but, so that's going to be yeah. just the reality I have to live with. And if people want to interact with me, they're going to have to live with that reality too. That sometimes so you I want everyone that. else to change, yes, but I you do. Do, you yourself don't. Okay, you but yes. you don't have that same I want, expectation I want of yourself. To accept me for who I am, because I can't be someone else. I have tried for sixty years, and I can tell you, I can't. We all have to be someone else. else. Yeah, we can't. <laughs> to be perfected. So, so what a person needs yes, to do. That's in this right. Situation, Right. So what a person needs to do in a situation when a brother offends you, what do you do? What does the Bible say to do? Can we? Yes. OK, let's follow that thread of thought and then we'll go back. OK, yeah. what does the Bible say when to go in and talk you? to that person to say right. that that person you offended me? Yeah. But how many people do you think have come to me and talked to me about any of these things? Well, I'm talking you to are you. Offended. You are. OK, so you're the first one. This is how we bring things to the light, Theodore. And love can so overcome that. Saying. Please, please. So, so, so then don't you think that the onus is upon the person who is offended, according to the scriptures. The onus is on the per person who is offended to go to the person who has offended them and to reconcile with them. It's not, the onus is not on the person who has done the offense. Okay. Right? Is That's that what not what we did? did? I've did read Huey lots. not do that? No. Nope. I thought he did make his position clear. He never came and talked to me. He never contacted me okay. about any he of this. Did no speak one, up. one ever has. He spoke up. He spoke up during that session. What What would you like people to say to you so that you understand that a brother is coming people, to you? What I want people to do is if they're offended by me, is to come and talk to me. I will apologize for the hurt I caused. And, and if there's something that I've done that hurt somebody, like when I watched Colin study Saturday night, I could see that he was hurting, that I had hurt him. That's why I phoned him mm -hmm. up and apologized to him. Mm -hmm. Because I saw he was hurting. But Colin was receptive to that. Many people are not receptive to, to talking to me. Actually, through my whole life, I have had maybe a handful of people who have been offended, who has come and talked to me and been reconciled with me. And those people that have been offended by me, that are reconciled with me, they're still reconciled with me today. That is, once they were able to accept and tell me, look, I understand who you are as a person, and I'm not gonna try to ask you to change who you are as a person. And I'm gonna accept your apology. I'm gonna accept that sometimes you say things that make you look like a jerk. So w when they do that, then they're accepting me as a person. But when somebody says, look, you just need to change. You need to figure out some way not to have this happen. Well, don't you think that I've thought about this for 60 years? That I've, I've worked on this since I was a child? That my mom has talked to me about it and helped me? That Heidi has helped me? Other people have helped me? I went to, to counseling uh, for years to try to help me to understand this, how I could interact with others. And I've improved leaps and bounds, as you know, right? I'm much better than I mm -hmm. used to be. And, and Heidi's a big part of that. One is she helps me socially because interacting with people is very, very difficult for me. And Heidi is like mm -hmm. an entering wedge for me. So now I can, mm -hmm. I can talk to people and she can make me feel a little more comfortable She's kind of like this right. barrier between me and people. But I'm terrified of having to do what I do. But I do it because God tells me to do it. I would much rather not do any videos or ever speak in public or ever speak in Sabbath school because that was my nature before. I never talked. I was, mm -hmm. I, I was as quiet as a dormouse when I first became yeah. an adult. I didn't talk about anything because right. one is... I'm going to put my foot in my mouth, right? And and yeah. it's been hard. So I've, God's put me in these situations of going door to door selling art, going door to door selling fruit, going door to door selling honey. 
going door to door, selling my scripture songs, singing to people, working in a guitar yeah. store, teaching, teaching, uh, doing all these yeah. presentations. So I get better at it. But people are saying, well, you heard somebody this one time. Well, if I heard someone, maybe what that person should do instead of responding immediately that they were hurt or offended is just be quiet for a little while, take a bit of time to think about why it is that they, I hurt them. And if they really feel that they need to talk to me, then come to talk to me. But when people talk amongst themselves and do the work of the accuser of the brethren, that is they mock, they belittle, they misrepresent a person's character just because they happen to have a certain type of personality that's easy to criticize. I have one of the easiest sort of personality profiles to criticize. People find it very easy to speak negatively about people like me because I'm socially awkward. I don't have the skills that you guys take for granted. And I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair to this movement. I think it's dangerous. I think it's undermining this movement when people talk about people. There's no reason for it. All we need to do is if we're offended by someone is go to them ourselves, not talk amongst it about ourselves and, and misrepresent that person and other people get all of these biases about what this person's like. Yeah. People are not following the counsels of scripture. I am, that is, I am praying daily. I'm working hard at this. Heidi helps me with it. God helps me with it. But certain situations have arisen. And I don't believe that I was the one that brought in a satanic spirit in those situations. I don't think I was the one who was creating those situations. I got caught in situations that weren't created by me, where people were trying to find fault. That's my belief. And okay. And so to try to put the blame on me that there's somehow there's something magical I can do. I know who I am and I know how hard I work at this. And this, you know, how many times I wanted to give up doing any presentations. I would say hundreds of times in the past two years, I've not wanted to go on and do a presentation, but I pray to God and God gives me the conviction that I still have to do this no matter how much I hate it. How much, how much, how hard it is on me, how much it wears me out. And, and, and I saw Jeff go through the same type of thing because Jeff actually has a very similar uh, problem. He offends a lot of people. He's offended a lot of people because of how he is. He's a little bit different personality, but he was, he could easily offend people. And this is just the way that he is. When you love him and you understand him and you accept him, you know, you can, you can, love covers a multitude of sins. I don't hate anybody. I'm not angry at anybody. I'm not asking, saying that somebody should, should do something. I'm not demanding anything of anybody. All I'm asking I... is that people, people allow me to be myself. And I'm going to continue to be myself until the day I die, because that's who I am. And it's somebody that God loves. And, and my mom loved me and she understood me. There's lots of people who love and understand me. And, and those are the people that I'm going to interact with. But I'm also being asked by God to continue to present in spite of the fact that some people might be offended. And, and, and this whole study, everything that I'm doing here is supporting Colin, supporting Odilio, supporting Stephen, supporting Dwight. You know, I'm not attacking any person, even if I might feel that there are some things in their character that I don't like, if I'm going to ever address it with my lips, it's going to be to that person or with my wife, because my wife is my counselor. She helps give me perspective. But I'm not going to go around talking about other people, what they're like, what their personality is like, what mistakes they've made, because that's of Satan. That is of Satan. But occasionally, being offensive because I'm so focused on the idea and I can't. I can't even see these people, which makes it way more difficult for me. You know, yeah. I don't even know what their expressions yeah. are. And, exactly. And they, it does make it right? very difficult. So, so we need to be patient on these study groups. It shouldn't be this sort of free-for-all. Colin and I were having a good discussion that time, I thought. 
And I was very surprised that that Huey, you know, wanted it to stop because I was helping Colin in his presentation. I wasn't hindering his presentation. And now, sure, some people thought it was wrong. Well, just be patient. Allow a person to just sometimes do what they do as a person and, and not jump on them because they're, they're who they are, right? So, I mean, that's all I'm asking of people. And, and I don't think that's much to ask because everybody demands it of me, right? Don't they? Yeah. Well, so, people expect it of each other, but I just want to ask a couple of yeah. questions. Carl, yeah. uh, like, so you said something that, you know, other people just take it for granted, like they come by it naturally. Mm -hmm. I know many people that have had to work on caring about the, the person that they're talking to. Um, and I'm not talking about like a supervisor talking to an employee. I'm talking about, you know, peers, people in the same class, like in college or whatever, yeah. people in the same, like th there's many people, and you know that I've worked with children for mm -hmm. 25 years and adults as well with Asperger's. And this is a very common difficulty that many people have. We're all on the spectrum somewhere. And so I just wanted to clarify to, to let you know, it doesn't, it doesn't come naturally to most people. Most people have to really work at it. Okay. Most people have to really work at it. Okay. And that's, the other and, that's why I, it, and that's why I don't get offended by people because I accept people okay. as they are. So I, I never okay. expect from something, something from somebody that they're not able to give. Okay. Right. That's the way I was raised. Okay. Everybody valuable everybody's important um doesn't matter their social standing their intellect you know any of those types of things none of those things matter the person is valuable in and of themselves and that's how i treat people i learn okay. from all kinds of people i value colin i value value adelia i value huey i value you i value rosanna right everyone and Angela and Chris and an iPhone, I value them too, right? I value every single one of the people that I interact with, whether it's a customer coming into the store, whether it's a guitar student, yeah. I value mm. every single person. I care okay, but, about everyone very, yeah. very deeply, but it doesn't okay. mean that I'm going to know that something's going to offend them. And if they're offended, Instead of broadcasting that, they need to come to me. Now, I realize that some people aren't going to do that, but it doesn't make me hate them. It doesn't make me think that they're bad people. They're just human beings, right? And, and that's all we have to recognize is that we're all human beings. We all have, have blind spots. We all have things that we can't understand. And see, I was sympathetic with when Stephen had done a presentation on, on chronology. And, and I made some sympathetic statements. In my mind, they were sympathetic. That, you know, well, you know, I'm even having trouble understanding what Stephen is saying. Like, I can't remember everything. He went through it really quickly. And, and I can imagine that it's difficult for others. But I encouraged people to continue to study and that you don't have to remember all of these dates. They're not the most important thing if you can see the general idea. That, that these witnesses exist, right? Well, people after that, when I got off, they began to mock me as if I was thought myself better than other people. Oh, if I'm offended, right? Now, why were people mocking me? That doesn't really make much sense to me because one is I wasn't saying anything like that. I wasn't putting myself above other people. Other than the fact that I've studied all this chronology and I realize it's difficult and I, I understand numbers. The people saw fit to mock me and, and people felt justified in mocking me. That is, they really thought that I think of myself as high and mighty. Now, those people don't come to me and talk to me. They're the ones who are losing in the end, right? Now, some of those people hardly even know me. Right? They never taken time to get to know me, even if they had that opportunity. But many of them are never going to know me. But some of those people who mocked me know me. And other people who didn't know me 
would see this mocking and they would get this same impression that Theodore thinks he's better than other people. And that's the first that sting from the truth. I never think of myself as better than anyone else. That, that would be crazy. We're all human beings. We all have faults. And we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. And I have learned some amazing things from some of the simplest, unassuming people. People that other people have rejected. And I've learned great lessons from those people. And I believe that's true with everyone. Every one of us is important. Every one of us has value. This movement is not about who's saying what or who's doing what. God is leading a people to do a work. And in order for us to do that work, we have to come together in the upper room and confess our sins one to another, not like, uh, you know, Parminder and Tess, where you where we have hurt somebody, we come to them personally. Where we are hurt by someone, we say, you offended me, brother. <coughs> you offended me, sister. And, and come to an understanding that just because somebody offended you doesn't mean that that person is not valuable. And it doesn't mean that that person is careless um, or unloving or unkind. It just means that that person is different than you. You know, and some people are more different than others, but that's just the way humanity is. And, and that's where I think that this movement is going. That's what I saw from the upper room study that Odilio presented, is he was really illustrating something that he didn't realize what he was illustrating was where this movement has been heading, is we're heading to that upper room. And all of these symbols that Odilia has found in the numbers and dates, all of these lines that Stephen has found, all of the insight that Dwight has gleaned from, from studying the Bible, all of the things that Colin has been given in regard to this structure, these things are all important, just as each individual is important. And if we try to say that somebody is doing something wrong that there's something wrong with them then we're denying god because god in spite of the fact i wish i was never a part of anything that had to do with people god keeps putting me in connection with people and i have to endure it but i believe that oh, god has a purpose in it what's that absolutely absolutely right. i'm glad that you've come to that conclusion because we are to love each other really yeah. love each other right. in a self-sacrificing way yeah. to efface ourselves. Mm -hmm. We should be effacing ourselves before we even talk to another person. Mm -hmm. Try to think of some kind word, an emotional, positive emotional word to preface every statement. Okay. Well, with, I, can't do, like, I can't do emotion. Speaking to somebody sick brother, or sister, I love you, and I have a different opinion. Can I tell you it? You know, like we have to practice these ways of being loving, not just assigning value. And I know, I know what you mean by that. Every person does have value. You're right. Yeah. And everything you said, I thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> well, and I appreciate and, everything that you've done here. Now, the, the reality, though, is that most people who know me consider me to be very loving which might be surprising to people in this group. But people who actually know me, <laughs> they interact with me all the time, students, customers, um, relatives, some of my close friends, they consider me to be one of the most loving people. My, my oldest brother, John, um, has he was jealous of my character as a child. And so he used to give me uh, gifts at Christmas that he knew I would hate because he wanted to see, see me um, be disappointed. And he confessed this to Heidi uh, a few years ago. Um, but he would never tell me that. He said, I, there's no way I can tell Theodore that I did that. You're gonna have to tell him. Because if I told him, I would just start bawling. But this is the way that I was perceived growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up. 
I was the <laughs> one that all of the, the neighborhood went to. I organized all of the events because I was the caring big brother in the neighborhood. But yet, when it comes to Adventism and this movement, there's a lot of people who hate me and, and, and don't understand that I'm loving because I maybe speak a different language than them or whatever. But this is about, as you're saying, we have to be able to care for one another. And the question is, how are we going to do that? I can only do yeah. what God's given me to do. I, I can't do, you know, I can't do politics. Like in a church, you know, if I wanted to be accepted in a church, I could do the thing where, you know, and you greet people and you shake their hand and you talk to them and you, you make, you know, you do all these social niceties that make you people, people feel like they're, they're cared for. I cannot do that. You no, may because that you've told me, you've you've said that you're afraid of people and oh. fear casts out love. Well, yeah, fearful in the sense of doing something wrong that's going to hurt them. I'm not scared that they're going to hurt me. I'm scared I'm going to hurt no. them. That I'm going to say the wrong thing, right? Anxiety. And, and, Anxiety. And yeah, right. And and that's because when I do do the things you're talking about, I do say the wrong thing. I actually have had those people more offended by me being nice to them than by ignoring them. And I can give you lots of examples of where I've reached out to people, I've said really nice things to them, and I tried to do what you're talking about, but I don't have that skill. Those people uh, ended up hating me even more. So I don't know well, why. Don't that take don't take my context wrong. I, I was I was referring to when you're sharing information. And it just goes back to what I said. People care more. They, they don't care what you know unless they know you care. So that's, I was just a point. Okay, but if I tell people I care, how are they going to know that I care? Um, well, especially on Zoom, it's difficult because you can't smile at them and, and establish eye contact and right. be calm. You know, mm -hmm. you, you actually have to use your words. And, you know, your, um, the volume of your voice, the pace of your speech, these are concrete things that people can be aware of and practice doing to show that they are in a calm spirit, they're not agitated, and they're not going to be accusatory, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you're saying something controversial, you can say, I don't want to be controversial, but I do have a, a comment. You know, like I, I really respect other people's opinions, okay. but I have a different opinion I'd like to express. Yeah, and when I've done that, that what's, happened? what's happened when I've done that? I, I've done that very thing that you're talking about. And well, I shut I don't, down. I don't know okay. if you agree or I, not, but I've done that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I was just privy to that one episode where Huey basically spoke up yeah. Colin shut down and I spoke to you later after the recording was over mm -hmm. um, but at the time yeah like it was just what I've said before it was um, you know I think we all need to be aware of are we interrupting are we raising our voice and talking fast those kinds of things okay yeah, I listened yeah. to it again after you because you recommend I listen to it. When I listened to it, I didn't see what it was that could have caused uh, Huey's reaction. Now, afterwards, well, afterwards, mm -hmm. you know, people kept saying, yes, you know, theater needs to stop. And I'm saying, look, I don't want to be in this situation because I want to be a part of the study just like everyone else. And I don't want to have it happen when I start to discuss something with somebody that I think I'm doing. In, in a fair way, I didn't wasn't attacking him or or anything. That's the only time my voice got raised from what I can. And, and, and I've watched the video a few times. So okay. I thought Colin and I were just having a fine discussion. I didn't think that Colin had shut down. You know, but maybe maybe he had and I hadn't recognized it at that point. But in anything that I was doing, um, I didn't expect to have Huey say, you know, stop talking, right? I just didn't expect that. 
And I would say, well, why? You know, I want to know the answer to this question. It's pretty simple. It's not difficult. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? So I put, I put, I, I realize that I have to work at this. There's no doubt about it. But I, I don't think it's, it's a fair assessment to say somehow that I'm, I'm not working at it or that I'm careless about it or that I'm not trying to do something about it. It's just that. I'm really glad to, glad to hear that. I like yeah. that. I hear that a lot. With uh, I receive that in my heart more than, you know, trying to justify or make excuses or expect other people to make all the accommodations. Well, I think all of us have to make accommodations. And, and I don't think anything I've done is an excuse. I know people throw those types of words around, and I don't think that they're actually fair. When somebody says you're in denial or you're being defensive or you're making an excuse, that's actually not being very helpful. Um, it, it, I never say that to other people because I know one is it shuts down communication. They're, they're actually non-communication uh, words to use. You're never going to help anybody by saying you're in denial because the person says, well, I'm not in denial. Well, proof that you are in denial by the very fact you're saying you're not in denial, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, so those types of things, and I've analyzed this over the years of the types of things that people say that really aren't biblical. The Bible doesn't say it's wrong to be defensive when you're being attacked or when you feel you're being attacked, right? Nothing wrong with being defensive. There's nothing wrong with explaining why you did something. That's not making an excuse. And, and just because you don't agree with someone does not mean you're in denial. Because I know myself way better than anyone else. And I know the problems that I have, the faults that I have. And those things I work on all the time, constantly in prayer, especially when I go on where I know people aren't going to receive what I have to say. You know how many times it's I've never said it. What? Very, it's very powerful to hear you um, saying that you are being, you know, um, taking responsibility, mm -hmm. looking for responsibility for what your part was in these things. Mm -hmm. That's very, very powerful well, thing to be. Um, well, I'm the only person I have control over. So I, I don't, I mean, I understand what other people I think they need to do for themselves, but I'm not asking them to do it for me. That is, nobody's hurting my feelings, right? My feelings aren't being hurt by people saying the things they do right that's, that's not really an issue for me but they are hurting themselves when they don't talk to me when they've been hurt by something i've done and they refuse to talk to me that they talk to others they're not only hurting themselves they're hurting the other people around them and you will never hear me tearing down other people and and this is something i learned years and i mean i learned this from my mom when I was a child, I mean, I already understood right. how 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 people are affected and what it is, how we need to accept others as they are, because my mom accepted me as I was, and 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 that acceptance I try to give to others. So so I think it's an extremely important point. But we we you know one of the things that has offended people is that I've said that this movement is divided. And, and we know that it is, but some people have, have took offense to that very statement. And, and, and the way that they imagine it is that I want to have everybody following me. And, and, and of course, that's the farthest thing from the truth. I'm actually, but, I'd rather have- But you have to there. allow people to have their own perceptions, right? They have, to have so, their perception for a reason. But people are going to I mean, be offended, offended, or they're going to imagine evil. There's nothing I can do about them imagining evil. But we have to be careful that we don't imagine evil about our brother, just because they they differ from us in how they communicate and how they think and in some of their views. Can I say something? Yep. Yeah. I appreciate it, Rosanna. I, I think when... Um... People are presenting. Mm -hmm. We should be listening very carefully. 
because if it's coming from the Lord, we don't want to abuse it. Yeah. And, and yes. And so like, sometimes what I'll do is I'll, if I have a question, I'll write it down so that I can still follow along with what the person is saying, but not forget the question that I had. Yeah. Well, the reason I became a Seventh-day Adventist is I went to a Seventh-day Adventist church and I went for the Sabbath school. I, I, you know, I knew that their church started in the morning. Uh, so I went there and there was a Sabbath school discussion going on. And it was really interesting because I'd been in lots of churches and I'd never seen such a discussion in my life of people interacting and having real opinions that differed from others. And yet those people were friends. After church, I saw them talking together, enjoying each other's company. And I said, this is the church I need to join. And this is why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist is because we can discuss things and nobody has to be, um, you know, say the right pat answers, right? You can have an opinion. In Warbur Church, we can have some very good discussions where people differ, but nobody's attacking the other person or having an opinion. In our church, people can talk during the sermon. They can stand up and, and rebuke a, a speaker or a pastor been done many times in Warburg Church and nobody's offended because it's about the truth. When I'm in a study, if for me to be a part of a study, I need to be able to interact if there's something that's important to me to understand. And now, so I disagree with the idea that we should just listen to presentations. I don't like it when people just listen to a presentation that I'm doing. I, I want people to interact with me. I want them to ask hard questions. I want them to challenge me, like Bonnie has been doing this whole evening. I want that because there's no way that we're going to communicate if people are just listening to what I'm saying. And, and so I know we all have these differences about what we expect. But for me, Colin's my friend. And when he's giving a study, I expect that he's going to answer some questions that I'm going to ask. And that those questions aren't just for, uh, for me, I know that when I ask a question, that somebody else has the same question. And that's why I tell people to ask questions, because you may ask a question and you think, well, uh, I don't really need the answer to this or want to in bother the person. But somebody else may be having that same question. And, and the, the study can go in a completely different direction. And that can be led by God. So. I, I don't agree with this idea. I mean, I understand, I appreciate that you, you have this view about presentations, but it's not my view. And, and it's not something I ever want to be a part of, of, of having just to listen to presentations and not being able to interact. And so, I, you know, I've watched these studies, you know, not every study. Lately, I haven't been watching them because I'm basically worn out and I'm also doing studies with other people. But it's how many times I haven't said anything that people, of course, never take into account. How many times I didn't respond, that I didn't um, make a comment, and how hard that is for me to do. And the people, you know, when I look at how many times I've actually interacted with the group and how many, how many minutes I've actually talked in these studies, I would say over the last two years, you probably couldn't put 30 minutes of me talking together. Unless I'm doing the study, right? So, so this perception that somehow I'm interrupting studies all the time, I'm not. But when something's important, a point is being made or points not being made that should be made, Sometimes somebody has to speak out and I hate that it has to be me. I would rather somebody else, when I'm in a Sabbath school class and I'm sitting there as a student, I would rather somebody else say what needs to be said than me saying it and I'll often wait. And, and I rejoice when somebody else says that thing that I was gonna say. 
because then I didn't have to say it. It's, things shouldn't always come from me. That's one of the things I hate about presenting. It's because I have to talk all the time. And then everybody's going to think, well, Theodore just likes to hear his own voice because he's talking. But the reality is I rarely uh, talk in these types of situations. But when I do, you know, people people seem to, to get upset. And, and I understand a little bit why. But, but I'm often talking at a time when it's actually something's going on that needs to be addressed. And I try to address it in the nicest way I can. But that's not always taken that way. So anyway, I need to go. Mm -hmm. It's late. Yeah. But, you know, One I gotta... thing I want to mention. What's that? On your, on your uh, chart there you had before this one. Yeah. On the 265s? Yeah. Uh, you had two dates inside? Yeah. D did you notice that they were both a doubling? The, the 1122? Yeah. Yeah, and the 1224. No, I didn't. Yeah. Thanks for noticing that. The other thing I wanted to point out too, thanks Rosanna for that, and I'll make it really quick, is, you know, 1989, um, after that, two years later was when the flag went down and all that in Moscow, right? In 1991. And when you look at... 777 days later. Yeah. When you look at um, 2020, no, where was it? There's somewhere on this chart that it's two years apart. Same. Um, yeah, well, 2021 to 2023. But it's, it's not 777 days, it's 780 days. I mean, if we're going to go there, it could be a little bit longer. But, but we already know that 780 and 777 are related to each other because of the three days, right? So there's three more days uh, from 777 to get 780. So this was pointed by okay. Odilio in his study on the... Uh, the mandates. I think it was a different chart because there was a two year period. But anyways, <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to. I noticed that you probably have to. Well, we got was a different 2021 chart. here and 2023 here. So that's two years. January. They were closer together. January. It was a chart where they were closer together. Oh, I think. OK. OK. And I think well, it had 1989 on it. It was the chart that had 1989 on it, I think. OK, well, let's close. Anyways. OK. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for you making each of us the particular way that you have. You've given us gifts. You've given us uh, weaknesses that um, we need one another to help us with. And we've given strengths that others can be blessed by. You've given us um, your spirit, your love, so that we can truly love one another and that we know love covers a multitude of sins. Help us, Lord, to truly love uh, those that um, we find difficult to love. We ask, Lord, that you can be with us on the Sabbath. We thank you for the discussion. And we know, Lord, that there's many things that we think and feel, things that we say that need to be corrected. We ask, Lord, that through your spirit and through our contact with others, that we will be transformed in character. We pray that we can come together in the upper room, even though we can't be physically together, and that your spirit can be poured out upon this movement and that we can truly work in a united fashion. We know, Lord, that we need you living in our hearts by faith. And we're thankful for all the people who have you have given light to. I'm thankful for Rosanna noticing a detail that I never noticed. And we know, Lord, that um, even though we differ, you can use every one of us to your glory. 
we pray for the meetings this Sabbath, and we pray for all of our contacts with others, and we ask that you can teach us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.